All right. We will go ahead and get started, guys. Why? Look at you. Let me see this real quick. And then we'll turn this one on. I think. Yeah, there we go. Hello, Chad. I think. Did I start in the middle of an ad break? Why is there two ad breaks? It's a little wild. So I thought I went to the end of the ad break. Anyway, everyone should be back now. Uh, we are going to be doing a PSG VOD review today. Uh, I think very interesting stuff. Um, basically, also, if this doesn't get a lot of engagement, I will try to edit down and put it on YouTube later. Uh, at the very least, that will be fun. Uh, I know that PSG is probably going to be the most interesting team of the te to a lot of people, the teams that I'm VOD reviewing. I think we'll, depending on the research I do on the GAM team, we'll have some fun that day, because I don't know, given the state of what happened to their league, how legit that some of the games will be in terms of just like teams performing cohesively and having an identity, but We'll see, we'll see. For those of you who don't know, the way I tend to like to do VOD reviews is I like to look at the drafts and see if I can notice something about the drafts consistently. So we'll also do this, which... PSG Talon, S14. Uh, banned against, so most banned against are Callista Vi. So that indicates Ash, Lucian, so that indicates to me that this is a team that plays that through bot, but also has like some reliance on top prio. I saw a lot of rumble games, especially towards the end. And then banned by PSG Talon. So if I, I then look at these, maybe this is just like meta universally bans in the PCS. Uh, pretty substantial Golden 15 lead. Um, so probably indicates like early domestic uh landing dominance of some kind uh high blue relative to red red side wins which not too surprising but there is like a decent discrepancy there oh turn on the music is the music too loud my bad <sighs> there we go should be better <clears throat> and then I try to go from this in terms of selecting the VODs. I've already selected the VODs today. I like to do regular season um, as well as some playoffs games so that I can see kind of like the evolution of how the team performs. So this is PSG versus BYG. And we'll go ahead and flip through the draft. Maybe. Maybe YouTube will love me. One day YouTube will love me back. Can always switch to Brave. I think we found the hack, which was like... If I use a different browser for Twitch than for YouTube, then YouTube works better. That was like the hack that we found. So let me do that. We'll just grab this one and then we'll go over to the Brave stream. Uh, 
I will change the window. And there we go. Nice. Sick. Happy days. Um, so yeah, looking back. The problem is that Arja is probably the best new. We'll take a look. So first, so basically the way that I would go through this is I would look at the beds, um, see if there's consistent pattern, and we already noticed that this is the case. I'm guessing like they play, do a lot with like early lane prio based on bands consistently against them, and the bands that are priori they also prioritize is that to them it's like very important to have winning lane. So uh, we also do see like they drop ADC support to 4-5, but they pick the Caitlyn Lux. So they feel confident from this point that if you ban Varus, if you ban Zaya, even with the 380 bans on 123, that they'll be able to get a favorable matchup. Uh, especially because BYG, it looks like they early pick Senna based on the pick order. Um, so that's also worth noting is that they prioritize that. They were fine here picking Aatrox. I noticed in later drafts they kind of dropped the Aatrox pick, so I'm Part of the reason why I wanted to look at this is because I wanted to see how like this early pick Aatrox sort of interacted with their comp. Um, you have Corky, which a lot of people talked about uh, Maple being a very strong player for PSG, so we'll see, we'll see. I miss Husha, man. What a guy. Um, based on these team comps, so we'll wait until we're loading into the game. Uh, based on these team comps, I would expect, uh, like, bot lane prio, right, for BYG, and then, like, very, they have, like, very good long range for siege comp, and then, like, Aatrox is here to absorb the dive from, like, Nautilus, Zac, uh, Shindrauth, and then they also have, so, I mean, there's definitely some range escalation going on. Azir Senna versus Corky Caitlyn is very deep range escalation vibes. Uh, when you go into this scenario, this setup, like they're holding the bot, pixel bush. Uh, they're looking for wraparound, so this will be very common when you have double range bots. Is basically just to play for bush control so that you can bully the enemy team. Um, so I don't know if they realize that brush is warded there in the pixel, uh, but either way, that's going to be less relevant to them after they drop, like, potentially Lux could drop a ward here, base for sweeper. Obviously at this point, the wave's already in the lane, so that's not going to happen, but these are options that you would see, uh, this kind of team doing. So they managed to sneak a ward in there for BYG. So they probably feel a little bit safe from a potential dive. Uh, they also have tracked, uh, BYG have also tracked enemy jungler here uh, with this ward in position. Um, let's see, we have Comet Lux, so pretty much normal, overall normal room pages. You have Force Strike, Quirky, and then Phase Rush on the Maokai. I like the phase rush on the Maokai, but it also indicates like potentially going for AP. You don't have to with phase rush, but we'll see. We'll see if they're doing that, then they're going like for full on po poke, right? All right. Um, Interestingly enough, BYG managed to get the wave pushed in all the way, which I'm not sure what exactly happened here. Oh, it's the bounce. So they, they crash it here, and then they know that Sheen is bot side. Uh, right now, Sheen wins 1v1 versus the Maokai, so they let the wave basically just push out. Uh, that's a little unfortunate, but they don't have to touch the wave here. Like, this is, like... This is a super good window for, for Husha to kind of look for this because 
Him being bought here, and then here's the, the word in the brush. Him being bought here indicates that, like, you're missing your window to send a tower with a big wave and kind of hit them in the face. Hello, hello. How are you doing, Vision Bets? Um, but yeah, so this now though, like with Caitlyn Lux, you want to be able to, to, to push out on this window. So they should on the next wave start pushing out again. Um, both junglers will go top and then you'll have like a slight isolated TV2 for a short while. Um, but it looks like BYG are just going, but this like window is also 3.30 to 4 minutes. This is typically where a lot of bot lanes recall so that they can have like long sword or something for the Drake fight. This is also a good timing for them to know that the wave is going to start pushing back to them. They have a window to come back to lane um, ahead of Lux Kaelin, which is like super good for you. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Mobility. Appreciate it. Hope you guys are doing well. <coughs> we are doing some... We are doing some uh, PSG VOD review to get excited for MSI. Appreciate it. Appreciate the raid for sure, 100%. Uh, good luck on, um, yeah, good luck with the, the collegiate qualification, everything going on. I know the, the news is a little bit sad, but hope you're doing well. <laughs> All right, Caitlyn Lux will look for this window to push out bot all the way. They have one word behind here, and these are up. I think normally in the sequence, like the the Sheen side would win, but you also have uh, Aatrox, who's a bit stronger on this window. Um, you also he's also level six here, whereas Driver didn't get six yet, so. They are giving this for the Corky base, and then it looks like they'll probably try to contest Drake instead. Would be my guess. Like, Betty and Woody should really be winning on this wave. Um, they did manage to match base, so they should be able to stack a big wave here. And then it'll be easier to contest Dragon. I would say both of these mids are kind of silly and useless in Dragon Contest, except the uh, 1116 does have Hail of Blades. So we have that going for us. So now he's on, so they, also interesting to me is PSG like not contesting Bot Pixel Ward, even on Window when they know Sheen can't be bots. Like, so now it's just pretty much uh, they can get full control. They know this pink is dropped, so in when you when your enemy support is dropping a pink like just this second, you don't necessarily want to fuck with it too much because yeah yeah, that can happen. It, it was like really telegraphed, but they got the flash anyway, right? Malka came in, but Malka has six, so this is why like they're running because typically you would have uh, Xin Zhao winning, and you saw them come and look for the turn. But you also have uh, Shino Flash. Uh, he gets hit with the Vine now, and then he uses uh, all of his spells, and then Maokai is coming in. So Maokai can have Snare here, so they're trying to cut it out, but then Maokai suddenly hits 6, and it's like, oh fuck, man. It's not good. <clears throat> wow, I'm surprised Woody doesn't die here, too. Let's take a look at his spell usage on this window. Does he end up using Shield? Yeah, he has- wow. But he doesn't even use shield- like, they just- I guess- I mean, if you're a Husha, you have to go in on that, right? Like, you're dead regardless. It was an attempt. An attempt was made. Base? So uh, here we get this, which is like, he's, I, I do, I appreciate from Woody, like, kind of the confidence to, to walk up. Like, he knows something's going on because they just placed this pink. He sidesteps. 
um, gets the snare on. I think he was not maybe expecting at this point like the, the Shin Zhao Pincher to come from this side. Maybe he thought it would come from this side because he walked this way. Uh, either way, like gets himself in a bit of a bad spot, has to flash. And then the general engage and split, follow up with the ulti. Fung gets out, but in general, nice double. And it looks like after this, Jinja goes top, secures his lead. Looks like Aatrox is doing a little worse than you would expect in this lane, but now he has uh, Executioners, so he should be keeping Zac from sustaining pretty consistently. I like how the both 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 tops just went straight up for the anti heal rush. What a banger! This is this is top lane in 2024. Either that, or you're going like Ghost Flash with the most evil crap in the game, like range stops. Or you're getting swapped down. I mean, it's just, it's like two out of three times you have a miserable experience. Okay, pulls. Oh, nice slash from Fung. They're up around. So I wanna do wanna see kind of how they get into this position because it, it went from them being top and then it looks like they contested some of the visions. So Fung went for this like tiny room. It looks like out of probably out of base. We got river control here. Um both junglers spotted each other on top. Uh, looks like Corky is one base ahead of Azir. So they end up using this timing window to get the pink. Uh, line brush with pink is really whatever in my opinion. If like the sun of placing that is probably a problem. Should have placed it like further in or gotten this, this ward here. Either way they clear it out. Pretty free of contest. Feels like uh, PSG, unironically, are pretty low on like overall agency. They basically just want to push out, use control for this vision window. I don't know. It feels like they're just not being contested after that one fight on skirmish on bot side. And there was also just not a contest, not like a commit to fight on top side. I mean, it's not bad, right? Because it's like they're both teams are kind of acknowledging when they lose, lose and catching their losses, which typically you don't see in any regions. <laughs> so it's not terrible, but it's also like, all right. Wow, what was that, man? Stay tuned. By by the way, banger. Stay true. Stay true. Slay true. Wow. Okay. Really. Really am not doing well on his name here. Slay true just proving me wrong, man. We gotta watch the hook. Ah, uh, Even if he hooks Woody there, which he wants, it ends the same for him. I'm not quite sure what he was looking for, but maybe he didn't think Corky was in position? I, I don't know what he thought. Uh, either way, it's not terrible for BYG. Um, they get this is like a very late first Drake, eleven minutes. So I'm not so BYG shouldn't be too concerned. And they end up getting six grubs out of this, right? So or well, they get three grubs out of this, like the second grub spawn. So that is very nice for them. Like overall, I would say that if Slayshrew doesn't int there, it's not the worst. Hello, Trespasser. How's it going? A 
clearing out all the pinks and try everything here. Nice. GG's. This is basically just typical bot lane gaming. Now Quirky is like consistently getting prio on the Azir too, which is a little weird because Azir has uh, Nashers versus Mirmana, but it's whatever. I guess this is the power. Pusha can't do anything, slow on rotation. Azir TP. Azir TP'd, man. That is interesting. Oh, he TP'd mid. Okay, that makes sense. It's like, did he TP to this fight? There's no way, right? Um, they're just walking straight past S3. Uh, Husha's on top side. They got they got indication from the fact that he pulled and took the the grubs. Jinja. Uh, they went for this dive off of that window. So like the reactive timing is really nice for them. The fact that both top laners TP'd and Azir rotated when I don't know. It's very interesting. Let me see this one again. So Corky comes here. At this point, Fung is is just like dead, not in it. And I'm not sure why Driver is TPing, and I'm not sure when his jungler is like this far out. I guess this is when he has his window because he gets his wave in, right? Notice the, the Aatrox movement. Spots out the jungler, see, see Aatrox on the ward, killing the ward. He's like, all right, this is my window. But Slager is already dead by the time he channels TP. More or less. Or not Fung. Excuse me. Not Slager. Fung is already dead by the time he channels TP. More or less. Just at least pours out of the fight. Like really low. <clears throat> so this feels like a really bad fight to TP to. Like this. I would understand if he's like under tower. Or if it's the window and they can defend the drive. But it's just very strange from BYG. Sturdy streams are really fun. <sighs> yeah, no worries. We're checking out PSG. I realize that these might not be like the most exciting streams for people, but I would be bother viewing them anyway, so may as well stream it. Uh, Drendra is like doing a really good job of basically putting himself into situations and using his lead to basically make sure that no one can do anything. So, like, I do appreciate his positioning in some of these fights given his lead, but it's again like we need to watch games where he doesn't get a lead and he doesn't have like 1.5 items and doesn't get like the super efficient frozen heart that it was on this patch. He's already half HP, but he knows that everyone can collapse on him. Buys a shit ton of time. Really good, uh... Snare placement from Woody 2. Or snare me from Woody 2. I'm curious if Woody is, like, considered a really strong player on this team, because I think he's... played the Lux well, at least, overall. And he, he has, like, confidence in his movement enough to dodge. And look for windows, which I like. But we'll see more games of him. Oh. So the ult, the ult them, ults the Maokai off, but that means that you can't use ult for damage or you can't go for like the swoop to whoop. Aja, like, pushes everyone back. They're sieging this, so no one's touching the side wave. They're just going for mid T2, which I think is the most useless T2. This was the sick maple flank. Interesting that they're willing to kind of, like, burn their package timer on Rift Contest. I don't mind it, because like I said, the first dragon take was super late. Like, it was a super late first dragon take from my perspective, so... Uh, securing first strike is probably not gonna matter, or er, looking for soul timers is probably not gonna matter that much to you. 
So the most important thing is having it up for maybe a Baron then. Uh, Corky's on top side. We're getting midway pretty aggressively, pretty forward. Pulling Krugs. Hmm. Oh, thank you, thank you, J Bomb. Welcome. We're just doing some PSG VOD reviews. So if you're interested in learning about PSG ahead of MSI, this is a good time. I have not watched pretty much any PSG games this entire split. I'm familiar with a lot of the players. Obviously, I think a lot of people will be familiar with uh, at least three of the players on the PSG team if you watched International League before. So, but. Uh, I'm trying to do a sample of VODs like from their split, so if you're interested in that, it's a good time. Most striking thing in this game is like how late they got the Drake despite having the Kayla Lux. Um, so like 21 minutes, only two Drakes taken, it's kind of crazy. So this rotation, they have Aatrox pushing this wave. As soon as Aatrox pushes this wave, they need to rotate to top side for control, I think. Um, oh no, it's six seconds until Drake. I thought it was 36 seconds. If they rotate here, because they already have vision here, so Corky is actually pretty late on this wave. Um, if this were 30 seconds before Drake, it would matter a bit more. This to me is like a give posture, right? Because Cork. Uh, their Lux is the only one in the pit area when it spawns. Aatrox does get the wave in all the way, so it's very easy for them to rotate to like a bot siege or to even just straight up like... Aatrox has TP. Like with this wave in this position and the fact that they're like posturing so aggressively for this and Woody backs out, like you could just get in hit for this. It's just crazy from BYG. I mean, I feel like it would be worth to just get in here for this. They're gonna fight. Yeah, like... I don't know. I, I feel like... They're not even that far... They're Oh, they're tech angle down. What the fuck? Never mind. But... So yeah, you can take whatever fight you want, pretty much. But it is, like, this positioning here. The fact that they they can get cut out like this. It's definitely a mistake regardless. They do use package here. It does end up being a favorable fight, but it's interesting to me that like their setup here for this was like extremely kind of lazy or, or short, which we'll have to see in more even games if they do this better, because this would be like an oversight for sure in a normal game state. Yeah, the, the rabbit hole goes very deep here. Like, the play that I would suggest if I were doing a VOD review with this team is... Once they force out Lux, just looking for top play, and then all the players and just looking for top and hit, because then you're basically, like, forcing them into this spot. You get probably get, like, at least two kills here, and you pull Baron anyway. Um, but they're probably like, okay, we, we just fight because we win. But it is, like, this It would be the angle where you could potentially throw, because you have, like, you're face checking into so much long range engage. That said, you're 10k gold up, so if the players ended up saying, yeah, but, like, we're so strong, I wouldn't, it's chill, like, just fight here anyway, as long as you know the, the situation. What I do appreciate about Maple's rotation, though, is because the window on package is so short now, it's like 40 seconds. You basically get it, you run off base, and then you have to instantly drop it, right? So I do appreciate that he is basing, getting package, and TPing after Drake, Drake spawns. So you have to kind of play quirky like that now. Um... 
So I do kind of appreciate that. I don't hate it, for sure. And this is the siege setup we talked about in draft, like, Kate traps here, Malkai threatening ulti, and then I'd, even if you don't engage here, let's slay true, which he's, he's engaging here to try to get, like, auto trade and then turret hit. I don't know what driver's doing, man. Uh, even if you don't, even if you don't engage here as Slaytree, you're probably gonna ult this Maokai just to secure this tower. Because the ult, then they can't do anything during this window. That's interesting. Driver making in interesting choices, for sure. Because even if, like, it looks favorable because Maokai's under tower, He's just gonna pop ult, and then your entire team can't move. So you're engaging when your entire team can't move, which feels like guaranteed you're gonna die. Anyway, uh, pretty decisive win from PSG. Things that I would note for like next spot review would be, or for the next game, is like how they're using balling pressure, because they do obviously prioritize it in draft. Um, this was like not super convincing, but they had like one good bait play and they really delayed when they took drake so i'm curious if that's going to be a, a trend uh they played out the siege comp situation well they clearly understand like quirky win cons um Jundra is taking space pretty intelligently so it's like they they have a handle on how to play their traps which you can't even say that about like lcs L L lec teams sometimes so uh it's chill you know it works out Let's see. Next VOD. So also for those of you who kind of joined late, what I like to do is, um, what I like to do is I like to get a sample of VODs based on draft priority and also side select wins losses that span throughout the split. So that I get a like decent sample of VODs in different scenarios that aren't just playoff VODs. Um, and then I have like a good picture of like how the team develops over time. So that's the earliest VOD that we have. This one is versus DCG. Which could be a bad team. I don't know. BYG is like rated semi-decently. But they made a lot of mistakes. Um... So we have we have that going for us. Uh, Maokai first pick. Like I feel like this champ is still just broken. Um, there's a there's been a lot of deprioritization of Maokai, but he makes it very easy to. He's like very good against a lot of the mobile champs that get picked, but he's also um, creates a lot of space. Makes it very easy to take neutral fights. Makes it very easy to siege. Ends up being a good front line on like one item. Um, so bands, we're still going with like the Ash, the Viband common, so. Um, and then on this side, we've got Callista. So we're still seeing the, the perma Callista band versus PSG pretty much. Azir Ori. Alright, we've got Maokai first pick. Karma Lee Sin. Is PSG comp- I don't know, that was the first VOD I've watched of them this entire split. <laughs> so I have no idea. That's part of why we're asking why we're doing the VOD review, so that we can answer those questions. Um... We got Senna, 4-5, so Maokai first pick, Leashed Melio, so we're picking Melio with the Maokai, which is pretty based. Uh, the Carmelie Sin, which was like very popular for a while in LPL as well. 
which I'm still not too convinced by. And then the Aatrox Bryo. So this means, this was like, the reason why I picked this one is because this seemed to be the start of their like emphasis on Bryo top. Um, and then obviously they have the Lucian Melio. This makes me wonder if they're gonna be like super good swap teams. Um, we'll see, we'll see. I remember traditionally also Maple was like very well known for TF. Uh, so that's another reason why. So they should have, uh, depending on how they play the bot lane, like they can lose the bot lane, but they should have three prio lanes. Uh, maybe not prio mid in an isolated situation, but if you're snare, gold card, Maokai snare, um, you can easily like punish immobile karma for being immobile early on. And you'll have like movement from side. So we'll see how they go. How do you think Kevin changes impact swaps? They have Jundra, hope this helped. Thank you, thank you, Thunderclaps. Uh an LCS spot, Winston. Um it's a very complicated conversation. I think Winsome, based on individual performance, you could argue he deserves an LCS spot. Uh, just based on gameplay, based on other things. I would say, but it's not like a guaranteed, it's not like, oh, he's a top five support in NA. It's not like that, right? Uh, so then it's very hard at that point to argue depending on what his intangibles are like, that he should absolutely have one if he's not even top five. So it's a hard one. So I guess the short answer is no, he doesn't quote unquote deserve one. Would I be mad if he had one? No, I think he's good enough to be in the LCS, yes. <clears throat> Okay, so they have they they start out with like the cheeky little Nautilus invade. It's nice. They force Betty to flash. So we've seen PSG play a, a siege comp last game. This game we will see them still like play with Maokai, but play more like a pick comp style of a game of a of a team composition. So we're starting out with Betty no flash. And DCG trying to force split maps so that they can't bully ball lanes. So this will be interesting to see how PSG react to this for sure. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, to be a bro, you have to... You have to be willing to have some times where you're failing right and you have to not be upset if your situation is not stable right you have to be very committed willing to give up a lot that's like the the one counterpoint to a lot of the frustrations with the amateur scene being downside is, is you basically do have to it should be hard, right? It should definitely be hard. However, I do think the sudden downsizing, coupled with the fact that a lot of the scouting doesn't even look at tier two anyway, like the, the lack of presence in the scouting combines just makes it feel not just hard, but impossible. Um, so it is like very difficult because it feels like no matter what you do, like I, I've had this conversation before where it's like, it feels like it's almost more lucrative uh, for the orgs to, even for like tier two teams, to have a an import because the reality is that LCS orgs are going to be more interested in signing an import or paying a buyout for an import than for a native NA player. So yeah, it is very frustrating um, in a lot of ways. That is, it is what it is. Yeah, Travis put out a vid saying why it's impossible. 
Um, like, the big difference is that before relegation existed, so you could just prove it, right? Now you can't just prove it. <laughs> Oh, we're s st oh, I'm I'm actually surprised they go for this and don't just assume it's split map. Like, I don't even think Lucian and Melio are that upset playing split map. You can get the wave. You can play for make prio rotation and then fix the map rotation on the next round. Nar will get prio on top so you can TP if you're getting dove. So I think like if they have to be in this map split situation, I don't think it's the worst. But I guess for some reason they just don't expect for DCG to maintain the split map and then Jinja ends up burning flash here. So that's a little unfortunate. It, I think the frustration should be around why NA players aren't as good as KR. If they were flipped and they hella NA players got a fat pay to get exported, nobody would be complaining. I mean, I think the that's the problem is, with it is the generalizations. That's the problem I have with it. Do I think all imports are bad and shouldn't be in NA? No. Do I think that um, even if you're performing consistently well in tier two? and demonstrate that you are better than the quality of an import willing to come to NA at this time? Will you get a shot? Probably not. Like, that's the reality of the situation. Uh, so I think it, it's just like the generalization on either side that's damaging. Like, generalizing to say that there should be no imports is bad. Generalizing to say that if given the choice, you shouldn't do scouting and should just import is also bad, right? So I think, but the problem is, is that the second generalization in NA is very rampant at the moment. Um, and I have been in a lot of conversations and I've been privy to a lot of these conversations. People would be surprised um, how lazy it is to an extent. So yeah, that's, that's more of the issue. I am going to refill my coffee real quick though. <sighs> Um, I don't necessarily think Thanatos will flop, but I don't necessarily think he will... I, I don't think he will fix C9, and I don't think he will outperform uh, some of the other top domestic options that would have done well on C9. Pretty much. Didn't Shifi like openly admit that he's basically just trafficking Koreans at this point? <laughs> I mean, that is a more lucrative business for sure. Can't confirm. <laughs> mm. Anyway, um, so we had the first rotation. Uh, so they don't completely split map. They just go for Raptors. I think if they wanted to, given mid prio, he could have just hard for split map. I think just taking Raptors like this and leaving does set him kind of behind tempo. Oh, this is like a cute little wraparound from Jojo to get the blast cone over the wall to, to check the red. Because the ward won't necessarily spot him if it's worded in this bush. That's nice. I like that. Um... Like, he doesn't know the ward placement, right? So he ends up getting spotted on the ward, but I liked that he tried to avoid a very common ward location. Uh, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, the, the Lee Sin ends up going back. So the, the positive is that he will 
So like the the downside to this invade is that now Lucian like to to this execution of the invade from the jungle perspective, is now Lucian Melio can like fight for Pryo in this wave, and that means that the first camp that will respawn on this map is going to be Raptors, and you're going to have more XP from second spawn Raptors. So Maokai actually will win out on this trade by getting the first second spawn Raptors. Uh, so that's why I think it's like not that good for Lee Sin because he's sort of delaying his clear to accelerate the, the respawn of Junja's Raptors <laughs> over his own. And because they'll have top prio and you can make a pick on mid, it's also easy for Junja to now play for 665's second spawn Raptors. Yeah, I mean, all re that's but that's been my platform for a very very long time. J bomb is that we were way too late in addressing the high school sphere. Um, not many people know this, and I'm not saying anything because I'm glad Mark got the job right. Like I hold no ill will, but I was also in the interviews for the commissioner position, and one of my biggest platforms in the interviews was. Uh, high school and clean space um but i think part of the reason why that is not seen as something that we can do at this point is because the the, the product at the top is not healthy right the product at the top is not healthy so emphasizing reaching out to high school communities at this time is an issue that it, it's like too early to address um, it is something that I would love to be part of in the future, if I can be, because I have a lot of ideas, but we'll see, we'll see. But I think, like, the biggest issue is making the game more accessible to high school communities and esports teams, and making the path to pro, like, more transparent, and also having more emphasis on having coaches who are interested in working with the developmental space as opposed to just the top space um, in sports you'll often have successful coaches who work with developmental scene and they they specifically specialize in developmental uh, coaching but that does not exist in esports it's like if you're considered a better coach you just go for the higher paying job which is toward the top um, so it's it's interesting because I also don't think the scene is big enough to justify paying like a, a division two coach or a tier two coach like an absurd amount of money anyway it's probably not even healthy enough to justify paying a tier one coach a ridiculous amount of money anyway and the all pay should be scaled back most likely uh so it's a very interesting conversation because like you cannot pay super good coaches who probably are more suited to being developmental coaches anyway um enough money to be developmental coaches so, yeah, it's it's just one of those. <clears throat> anyway, continuing on our PSG VOD review, because, you know, good times. But yeah, I mean, this this is like also part of the argument, which is like, even if these, these scenes are not expected to quote unquote make money, um, they will always be the ones that get cut during times of financial tribulation, so, yeah. <sighs> like, I think something that we didn't touch on in the Hotline League episode that is also interesting to me is plans for expanding Game Changers. Uh, and especially in Europe, which like is for women and marginalized genders, basically got dropped, it seems like, and Riot are not saying anything about it. Um, it seems like it was cut fi for financial reasons, but Riot are not saying about it. And that's also like part of the developmental space is the league for, for like women and, and marginalized other marginalized genders. 
but it just basically is ceremoniously being cut and and no comment <laughs> so yeah <clears throat> All right, first blood on this Drake setup. So this is an earlier Drake, but it is initiated by DCG with noting. Um, they use Carfryo. They have Center Room to go for this. I didn't catch actually. Center Room is out of base, yeah. So it's actually bot recalling earlier from their leads. Senna basing here. Senna being first with Lee Sin. And it looks like just like a typical Raptors invade. I'm surprised that Jundrat doesn't go for like a mid gank here. Knowing that like he, he could get these Raptors contested. Ultimately he gets like the higher XP and gold value ones. Which are the little Raptors. So it's not too bad. And I think they're fine giving first Drake. But Maple, once again on his timings, like part of the reason why Maple is like considered so good is he's good at this element of the game, which I have to, which is just like very simple to, to talk to mids about, but they don't, very few of them do it consistently, which is as soon as you are about to hit your level six timing, which is like always the 530 wave. Uh, you should be looking for base before that and then coming back out, pushing the wave out, getting six on the the wave that will be mid at 530, and then immediately calling for a play. So like you'll see in these sequences, he's playing TF, his sidelines are pushed out and ready to contest this. Uh, he isn't waiting for the six wave, but he can clear a ward also. I like I would love it if the observer showed how much XP he has. He's just flashing for it. As you can see if he thinks he gets six off of like a kill or a ward kill. He does end up just walking for it and going here. But anyway, he's back out on the map in time for 530, like for the level six play, even though he ends up moving before it, right? You do have to adapt in these situations. Like you can't wait he can't afford to wait for another wave in this case, but the, the main point is that he's like thinking about the base timers around that that spike. And now he does have six, and I do like this from uh, Chris Gata too, which is just like instantly get him as low as possible so that he has to base when uh, DCG is also contesting top grubs. I think that was like really well done by him. You'll see like any players and eco players do that a lot. And then of course Karma can do it too. It's just like if you play a very, very aggressive trading mid tramp, we could just all in them on this window. That's also why you'll see like junglers and supports roam mid on that that timing a lot. So that's like another thing that didn't happen this game. Cause you the other thing to know is that with this TF combo, you definitely need pressure from your jungle. And I don't know if Jundra just feels like he got put too far behind. Um, or he's not getting like prior from his ball lane that he can play around. Like he definitely got thrown off by the invade more than I would expect, right? So he hasn't been hovering mid. They haven't been able to use like the double CC combo to push back on the karma. And now he's a level down. The grub spawn at six? Yeah, I mean, it's big for every champ that has, that uses like six window. It's huge for almost every mid champ. It's huge for like all solo laners who have like a huge spike on six. So you could say pretty much every mid laner, <laughs> except for ones that don't have like huge damaging ults or uh, timers at six where they basically always get prio. But Ari is like definitely because of the rune setup that she can go and because of her ulti, like definitely one of the ones you would think about the most. 
It does not benefit champs like Akali, for example. Let's put it that way, because Akali will get six, but she'll never move first. Like, she'll never move first on six timing. Uh, okay. So we've got this gank on top side, which was set up by, by Taco. Did he bait, like, a recall? It looks like he did bait a recall, because he, he, he got the wave in, channeled recall, then interrupted recall, then walked into bush. Uh, they're just setting up this play, which is cute, like, for sure, because they have ward on this bot, raptors. They know raptors hasn't been taken. So this is a nice play from 665 and Taco. Uh, definitely, like, abusing Tempo Trap. Meanwhile, bot is slightly griefing. Nice ult from range. Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't know if he wanted the the snare. Did not work out. I was about to start for 130, so anyone hanging out, sorry about that. That is how it is. Hello, big big Jeff. How's it going? I hope you're doing well. I do run ads because I am greedy and selfish. <laughs> But you can avoid ads by subscribing. Amazon Prime? Yeah. If you have Amazon Prime, you can sub for free. Uh, all right. Staring. Taco trades, basically trades one for one with help from the Sentinel, which is super good. And they're pushing all the way. So I don't know, for me, this should have been a game where they could have played for bot prio, where they could have played for mid 2v2 and they had top prio, but they ended up getting really thrown off by the invade, I think. So that's very interesting to me. And again, I think it, it it also demonstrates their Drake priority is still low, since they're basically checking Drake late. Once again. Nice. I mean, I have liked a lot of the looks from 665. So, maybe a name to keep in mind for the future. Oh, nice cute little ult out play from Audra to avoid the situation. Just out of the way. We're pulling Rift Herald on this window. That's interesting. I assume he just thinks like all of DCG is recalled. But he has to go top to stop Crescata. They're not tracking TPs, I guess. Unfortunate. Yeah, Nautilus, farm Nautilus with Karma Shields running at you is a bit annoying. Um, yeah, I think they're fine not taking this Rift Herald here and then just playing for two tier twos. Keeping tempo up. This is like nice from DCG for sure. Pull Drake. They get third Drake at 1633, so they're just like snowballing well. They're playing around, um, because when you're playing Lucian Melio, you're looking for windows where it's, like, isolated on mid. So now DCG can get, like, super deep wards and make it impossible for Lucian Melio to look for picks, even when Lucian's about to hit two item spike. Nautilus is super tanky as well. Just hooks, procs, hits W. 
Hooks procs aftershock and you can't do anything. Mm, all right. These are nice rotations from DCG, honestly. Do we like Leisha, Nami, or Amelia more? Uh, I think it depends on how you're... Who, the, the draft and also who is playing. I generally still prefer the Leisha, Amelia. Um, but if it's T, yes, like, I'm not complaining if make us find Nami. Around. I notice how they're just not contesting sides. They're just like running straight down mid now. Like when uh, when when PSG were overloading on top and pushing all the way, it was one thing because they could play two sides. But if PSG are going to catch mid low and then play both sides here, then that's like a good strategy from them because um, DCG will have to eventually catch one of like uh, catch one of them on side we'll have to, to rotate here so drake is up in like 16 seconds um nar has ulti so they're relying on the fact that dcg kind of like overextended for this mid two and that they have both sides pushed all the way out so they're expecting dcg to be showing on these side waves so that they can get dragon set up however no one is going to rotate top of this wave uh, DCG are just going to maybe even be willing to give this turret with uh, Bounty Gold for Soul, which if I am PSG, like I'll take that because turret 2 Bounty Gold versus like uh, Chemtech Soul is almost always worth it. But, I mean, this was interesting. I'm surprised by this one. So they they spot it out here. They know because they see Maple and Joja. They see these guys on this wave. They know Nar is probably TP'd. Like you can usually see TP on map or on mini map if you're paying attention. So they know the location of at least four members. They go for this engage while DCG. Well, one of them is at least on this window. So there's three here. Uh, Aatrox just got the wave, so he's a bit disconnected. I'm not quite sure... What, did, did he hit Blast Gun at the wrong timing? It's a little unlucky. Because you know where they are, so he's just like griefing for Blast Gun. And then good flank setup for Maple. Wow. Did he cleanse too early? Because it looked like he got stunned there. That's uh... Wow. Okay. Cool. I guess we could slow it down and watch. That's another thing that you have to be really concerned about when you're walking into a choke like this. Like if I am BACG, I want them to kind of walk in here. I can poke over a wall with Karma Senna. But I think they feel pressured to start a fight because of the position of this wave. Damn. It's like if you have Karma Aatrox, you want them to kind of walk in, right? And you can poke over the wall with Karma Senna if they're if you're keeping range, but running into them 
Running into like a Maokai ult. He has single, single stun card potential situation. Seems really rough. Anyway, it doesn't matter too much that they get this Drake though. I think slight mistake from DCG, but it shouldn't be... Oh wow, Turk gold is actually very even, I'm surprised. Uh, it shouldn't be like the end of the world because Senna still scales well. Aatrox is still in a good spot. So even though they're giving up this Baron and lost the Drake, I think they're still fine. Yeah. This is fine. PSG get the Baron. They only lose one for it. Not terrible. I don't know how PSG can lose with this draft. I mean, I think that they, they can win with this draft even from this position if they play side well but uh like if you're playing any front to back scenario you still have a pretty good comp from dcg dcg had like a good strategy that clearly threw psg off in early game and and set them kind of behind so i do like the way that dcg played like the first 15 20 minutes of this game it's very good but i think psg's reaction was also a little poor i love the flank for maple Still, like, the way Maple is playing these Drake fights is very huge. Like, I can see why people say that he's uh, an important player on the scene, even though it's only been, like, two, two games. He's had, like, a lot of Drake fight winning plays. Like, the, the big thing for me is PSG are not very... They play, like, Drakes for retake. And another team that's like this, if you're familiar with FlyQuest, is FlyQuest also tends to play Drakes for retake, so they're not very proactive about setting up a lot of vision on Drake early. Um, and they'll play for flank or face check. Or retake, like, basically when Drake spawns. The When you do that, you're optimizing your efficiency on the map because you'll get, like, an extra wave top, right? Or you'll play, set up a map state such that even if you lose the Drake fight, uh, they can't get a whole lot from it, right? That's, like, the, the main advantage of playing Drake's for retake is you'll have stronger solo winners, and enemy team cannot, like, play such that they are able to like get a lot of resources out of winning a fight so uh i do appreciate that that's like kind of the trend that we've seen out of psg when they've gone for this dragon it's like a very clear identity but their retake and their flanks have to be really well played to make that strategy work or you will lose so much gold inting fights um and face checking so uh, that's like something we have to watch out for in subsequent games either to see if they keep this like strategy over the course of the season or if they can keep like the 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 kind of like mid like maple sort of mid flanks going well um, so far we've seen him play like the TF and the Corky so Hello, Tristan. How's it going? So, interestingly enough, like, no one has touched this top wave, so they're going as four on mid with, um, Nar showing a bot ahead of this Drake. So... Here, this is a window where they're very much expecting PS DCG to be have to touch this wave. So this is like a more proactive Drake setup, where they don't have to touch touch top wave if they don't have to, they don't want to. Let's look at TP checks. So they have double TPs. So this isn't a situation where they feel like they can't CP to Drake. It is worth noting they have no TF ult, uh, no TF ult, so they can't like face check too easily. Because they have, like, all range champs except for Maokai. 
Pushwave all the way. So this is five on mid. Uh, do you know they have a very brief window to engage here before NAR joins? NAR is not anywhere near Mega though, which they would know because they would have seen that NAR pop Mega here. So they're fine taking, like, this is a, a favorable situation for them. Like, open fight, they can engage. Uh, they can position Taco and Orca such that they absorb, like, any of the single targets you see from Maple or Junja. Yeah. And they just kind of run the- oh, interesting, interesting. Okay. So Betty on this side is good. I want to see how they play this, because this seems to be... It looks like, um, 665 looks for a flank here. And Betty spotted him out. So Betty gets kicked out of the fight here. He has ult. So, okay. So he's getting the ult damage on to... Here, Jenja flashes out and 665 kills him. So now we have Betty and Woody on this side attacking the jungle. So now jungle's forced out. Orca is still like so tanky and unkillable. Um, Maokai ult is keeping all of the follow up in place. They didn't land the Q3. Aja is like able to kite this. And then Betty kills. 665. Why did he walk back into the fight? Actually, I did not even catch that. Because he runs out here. Uh, he has. There's full. I don't know. It's kind of weird. As he was looking for maybe like a quick trade, like Q, kill someone. So not bad, because that fight should have been, I think, way more favorable for DCG. They sort of like walked into lower terrain and chased into Maokail. Like anytime you're you you're kind of waiting for Maokail and trying to kite this. The problem is is that like PSU understands their comp's limitation was kiting them into river here. So that wasn't bad. Also Betty's targeting, like identifying where the Lee Sun was, and that he can hit him for free off to the side after he like over engages here, like that was well done too. So, I mean, again, they're they're identifying, like, good win cons of their draft. Uh, Audra? Huh. Well, whatever. <laughs> but you see here, like, even though the fight went badly, because DCG didn't touch this wave, or because DCG, oh, no, 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 they did touch the wave, never mind. Because DC, DCG are, like, in this position where they can hit they lost all these creeps, but they can basically end the game now. GG. Yeah, I mean, for this position, like, it's still, like, an even fight. I think PSG, if... If Audra's, like, not TPing here, if Audra's, like, even, because he knows his teammates are here, if I just like even TPing here, it's not the worst. Orc is like relatively low. Um... <laughs> the problem is you have no ult. And they do like way more sustained damage if you don't have uh, cooldowns on DSG side. Because you want to get picks here and they're all grouped. So you need some kind of flank angle here. So I think just giving this Drake and then going top is fine. But they go for TP. Everyone gets mind controlled by Drake's soul. Yeah, like, I don't know. There was maybe a miscommunication. Because TF TPs to the wave and auto TPs. Maybe they also didn't, I don't know. Maybe they didn't think they would see. I have no idea what the thought process was there, but... It is what it is. It happens. We move on. <laughs> um, I mean, they had pushing top, but the top was on balance. So let's see. 
because they pushed it all the way here. The problem is the Drake fight just went so long. Like, typically you would expect, because what I was talking about was when they did retakes, like when they're playing for retakes, they have someone go top ear. Always. But they didn't go top ear, which I was surprised by. Which indicates to me that they're like in panic mode over this Drake. Because it's soul. Because every other Drake, right? They're fine retaking late. Like every other Drake except for this one that we've seen them take in the last two games. They've been fine pushing this all the way to like zero seconds before Drake spawn. And just being on top wave until zero seconds before Drake spawn. TPing in and retaking re with a flank. But as soon as they... They don't do that. They kind of mess up a bit. This was like good because you kite them down into the river and you end up trading one for one. But then everything else was weird. Because now it's like, okay, we trade one for one. That's fine. We're fine giving a uh, chemtech soul. We should just push out top all the way and then make a play on the bot rotation. And we don't mind like fighting versus them because we're not going to fight them with chemtech. Especially not without ults, but it is what it is, it happens. I mean, they haven't the entire game, bro. Have you not watched the rest of VOD? This is like the one timing where they death ball. This is the one timing where they death ball. In the last two games, like, the, that you were talking about, you're like, ah, oh, they just always death ball with 1-3-1 cops. Yes, in this one game, that one time at 27 minutes. And they did not beforehand. They are death balling. Yes. Good conclusion. All right. All right. Here we go. Next VOD. So this one is, I think, closer to play. This one is playoffs. Uh, let's see. So... Wait, no, yes. Playoff stage two. This is against BYG again. Uh, so this is... I wanted this one because they get the close to first pick. That's banned against them so frequently. Um, there's no Udi or Rumble. And then enemy is plays Nami Karma into it. So the benefit of this is you're hopefully getting mid-prio. Uh, Maple again is playing a champ that's going to have like a good six fight for rooms and will basically look for flanks uh, and sideline control. I am getting vision bedded again, true. Um, let's see, next window. So a 4 or 5 ban Li Lee Sin Wukong and Ash Kasante. So they don't want- this indicates to me that they think they'll play close to Ash, which is good. I think Woody does- has been consistently just playing the range traps. Uh, pretty much all playoffs. So they're gonna go close to Nico, it looks like, maybe? Um... Close to Nico and Poppy, it's like definitely doable. I think Nico's not bad into Poppy. Close to obviously is a disaster though. Like the top side is a like these three chimps are kind of a disaster into the Poppy. Ushinami can play volatile bots. And then of course Big Croc match with Orin. So I prefer BYG's draft a little bit here, but I think you can do a lot with uh, the Ari Xin Zhao combination. So this is another game to kind of see uh, how they're playing around mid jungle timers because the last game was not great. Okay, we've got three on bot. Nico there. Audrey and Junja looking for invade.
Alright, so yeah, we have Karma expectedly getting Pryo here. Uh, close to Nico on first wave getting Pryo here. Gonna hit level 2 and BYG at least. Okay, back. Oh, uh, Renekton also getting Pryo. So everything's kind of going as expected. Poppy clear a little bit slower than I expect, but it's fine. It's like a better division draw still. He did the, the camps to take longer to take, but he should clear them very quickly. Yeah, alright. So, Shinjo can be bot first. I think what will happen is both bot lanes, like based on the trend from previous game, both bot lanes will kind of yield on this window. Shinjo gets the Scuttle Crab. Hmm, interesting, interesting. Oh, thank you. Wow, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. For the 50. Wow, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Apparently the, the Travis shilling worked. You know, Travis asking for money on my behalf. Thanks, really appreciate it. <clears throat> Callista, Nico, okay, game pause. Push that all the way. We've got bots. Is this even the correct song on? Yes, it is. Oh my god, amazing. All right, Shinjao. Bot pushed out all the way. We've got Wards and Bot Try. Poppy Karma. Looking for the wraparound, forcing uh, Ari off. So once again, we're not really playing through the mid jungle combo, which is very interesting to me because like when you had Carson Maple, it was always like, Play mid jungle on wave three, get double crab. That was like always the strat. Is Carsa a fraud? Uh, no. I think he kind of got a lot of he got a lot of attention, and I did. It's actually 2016 when Emily and I actually did this massive like jungle pathing project, where we actually tracked the jungle pathing um, over a large sample size of games. Um, for major players from, for, for like jung the junglers from all the, the major regions at the time, like LMS was considered one because it was coming off of t the 2015, um, LMS wor worlds and flash wolves being so strong. And of course flash wolves at that tournament were consistently able to beat the, the Kutagers. Um, but the, the most interesting thing to me about Carso was he was one of the, the first junglers to recognize early on, um, the, like, the power and the presence of, like, just going for double scuttle. Uh, and teams, like, domestically would just give it to him. So it would always make him strong. And then when Carso would go for skirmishes, he would just always win them. He would have like such a huge XP gold boost early, um, and that that was like part of why they were so dominant. The other reason being that they were very good at lane swaps domestically. Uh, so that yeah, was very interesting. 
um, watching some of those early games. I would say he did play very well, like mechanically in general, but he called himself the gambler. Like even when you interviewed him and talked to him, he would call to refer to himself as a gambler. And he just like would have a lot of advantageous early games where the gambles would pay off because he would be stronger. Um, so I would say that he wasn't a fraud, but he had like a very specific style that benefited a lot from uh, Flash Wolf's kind of understanding of the game and the map being ahead of everyone else in his domestic region. But he was still like obviously extremely uh, mechanically good. Betty is a fraud? Uh, to an extent, but I don't think Betty is terrible. But definitely got a bit overhyped. Husha with the wraparound. I actually really liked Husha when I did bot reviews of him like a couple years ago, but he has not kind of maintained the power. Nice, nice. We push out bot wave all the way. Renekton with the wraparound. Nice ward. Ah! Goodbye. They get the wave in. They look for recall here. Shinjo on the early invade, pulling blue. Because they see Husha walk into the jungle, no? Because they brute force it. Let me see. So this is very interesting. Yeah, he shows on mid. But do they actually see him walk into the jungle? They don't. Okay, okay. So they actually don't even know he's here. And this isn't warded. That prio, but this was not warded. I want to go back a bit on Nico's base. So interestingly, how's Nico based? That's the real question. Nico has not based. <laughs> this is also post um item nerf patch to my understanding like the the support item nerfs so that you can't do this as much with the Dorans anymore so this is very interesting he just doesn't base he just doesn't base for they pull drake they get drake He doesn't base until 620. This is like kind of one of those matchups where I would feel like you'd want to take an earlier base on the Callista Nico lane because you'd want one to get like the support item. Two, you'd want um because serrated Dirk will be cheaper than like Let me double check this. Like I'm one, like 99% sure this is true, but I don't want to talk out of my ass. Yeah, Serratic Dirk is significantly cheaper than Noon Quiver. So you letting Lucian kind of base on Noon Quiver without getting punished going for this Drake and then not going for like ser an early serrated dirk base is very weird to me here uh like he's only punished by like 10 cs so for me this is so strange that they did this they basically set their support behind for a 10 cs lead i guess it's like a little bit more than 10 cs it's it's pretty substantial in fairness 
But still, I'm surprised because he's able to base on Noon Quiver. So you lose like a good spike window for serrated Dirk item differential. Yeah, I mean, Nico can, like, Nico can basically get waved, and then you can also just force them to stay lane or to lose a wave if you go for early base as well. So it's very interesting to me that they chose to stay in lane for like six and a half minutes. Because now I feel like Lucia and Nami are in a better spot than they were. They're down to like two waves, but. Like, they're able to come back with, with full noon quiver. It, you don't have like Dirk 2 components, which would have been a much better spike to play on. So that's very curious. And then they also, because they don't base until late, like they don't get any vision coverage here. They don't pressure like the RA matchup on relevant windows. This is very weird. While they're playing for these, they still have the Kliss and Nico matchup. Poppy's getting this this wrap around, which we is why we went back. Um, BYG already have two grubs, so it seems like they don't care for the rest. Because you can just take them. They almost use grubs as a bait to get the, the wrap around here. Very fun. Interesting. Xinjiang on the pink. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is like the kind of thing that I would expect, right? So Ari has is sitting on her her tonic at the moment. She has a uh, lost chapter, and she's got potion from triple tonic. She gets the full wave. So this is like also if you watch a lot of LPL Ari's, you know that they frequently go like DMAT triple tonic so that they can kill wave and then instantly go for these types of scenarios. So jungle invading like this, Ari should be able to choose, selectively choose to go first so she has DMATs. Instead the wave is like pretty even. Callista, interesting to me that when they go for this invade as well. So we're not going to see the full setup because of this, but it looks like on base. Uh, Callista and Nico come out with Callista having had a death. Uh, get the wave in, and then they have this timer, and then on this timer, they lean mid, they kill the pink, and then, um, Shin goes for this, and because they see, like, Woody killing the pink, B, uh, 1116 does not pressure this wave state. And then, so this is, like, all coordinated for the invade. And then they use the, the, the Shin Ari ult uh, combo. Which is, is nice. So this was like a, a well coordinated play. This is the kind of stuff that I was looking for in terms of when you have mid jungle pairing like this and how you're using your bot prio in particular. Say it, Drake. Uh, PSG are clearing out all this vision. Ah, sketch. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, she doesn't look that great so far. I mean, since this is the, the channel where we subscribe to the shitty M, you can say that about every team. They don't look that great so far. <laughs> And they look fine, right? I think there's a lot of timings that I like from them. It does feel like they're not completely lost on their tramps, which, I don't know, that's a low bar, but... A lot of times, when I watch, like, LCS teams, I feel like... They don't understand the win cons of their tramps, so it's, like, at least nice to have that. Um... There's, like, some coordination in terms of plays around this. I think mid jungle sinking sinking given the mid jungle matchups they play is very fragmented. This is a good play setup for Mika or from Ma Maple. I think Woody is also stand out for me. I think he plays their their range traps very well and like understands how to get into position. Uh, I think Poppy like wrecked their draft really hard this game. Uh, Shindra still gets in there. Wow, they're so low actually. Here comes B BYG, the rest of BYG. Yeah, this was a really good graggle like can see from driver they get so low here and then they turn around there's a good drag out because it gets um damage on maple maple separates junja off during his ulti timer and then when his ulti is down uh, Husha, Husha gets him into a wall, and then the rest of BYG engage. So, like, Greg is Poppy, do what they want to do, and they buy, buy a shit ton of time. <laughs> the shittium. Uh, one of my mods calls it the shittium because, uh, a lot of people in chat tend to be very critical of literally every team. <laughs> literally everything and it's like instead of coping that actually these teams are really good they're coping that actually these teams are just terrible and no teams are good so it's a it's a little troll but you know chat tends to be very negative let's put it that way and it makes me sad sometimes because i feel like I feel like I like to, to point out good things about teams, but then, you know, my chat just, just says everything is bad, so it's just it's depressing. Except for an ACL, because Flycy will win worlds. Nice flash. BYG playing Drake. I have a lot of TL VOD review to do today as well. As I'm unironically getting paid to write an article in 2024. It's crazy, guys. And just backed off. Go for the driver kill, but BYG get the Drake. I also have the least of how things go. Nice flank from Woody. However, Spornika does no damage, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm honestly, I think the, the most glaring thing for me so far is just bot laning. Uh, PSG, like, very much prioritize 
uh, aggressive 2v2s, but they do not really pressure them that well. So that's interesting. I think I still like the way Jundra takes pace in fights. I think it's good. Um, and I still like a lot of the, the angles and picks that Mabel goes for. Yeah, Husher just yeets Mabel out of the, the game and then they win the fight. I like it. Nice, nice, Pog. Oh. Crag is shattering both sides. Let's see how this play is executed. Uh, because they have Gragas deep on bot, they have set up so many wards here. And PSG from Drake, so we're not going to see it. Because we have to watch the mid lane replay. But it looks like BYG hover for top side. Ronekton sets up this by, by pivoting towards this. They are down tempo because Ari has to catch this. If Greg is based here, it also depends on if they know Greg is CP timing. Because this would have to be like very precise. A lot of times because of the way CDR boots and Cosmic Insight impact TP cooldown and other factors impact TP cooldown, uh, you cannot time it precisely. So you'd have to be have like a very clear idea of Gragas timer to go for this play. The other element of it is that if Gragas is not basing here, right, that could be a big indicator that, okay, it's fine. Maple will just hold charm and prevent Gragas from, from TPing. Okay, he does get base off, so it looks like he does back out of vision, so Ari doesn't want to walk up, which means that he can no longer cancel. So he just uh, preemptively TPs here. This is like good flanker setup. So we see the ward placement happen for it, do we? It looks like the ward placement happened for it right here. Renekton's still in bush. Shin Zhao is still in bush. They have to answer this top wave. Nice TP. Wrap around. They see two. They get split. So, a nice little side lane trap. Uh, I think it's bad for Gragas to match this, realistically speaking. I think Gragas should just stay bot and pressure the wave, but... I think you'll get more from doing that because then you're pushing bot out all the way, you're recalling. Um, you basically probably only get one kill. I think it's very disengageable after that for DSG. Excuse me, for uh, BYG. But it's fine. He gets the, the flank off. They're still ahead for Drake because of the kills. They get third Drake, and then PSG pivot up and pull Baron. I'm sure that will go extremely well. And that's the other element of it is like if you go for imports just because they seem really good in their region, if you take them out of context, it's like really hard to tell based on personality, who will do well in like a new environment where they don't speak a language. Um, where they can get frustrated with teammates who do not behave the way that they're used to their teammates behaving, things like this. So it really depends on the player who will do well in those scenarios.
This is interesting. It's off of the Drake pole. BYG then rotate into Baron without any waves being touched. Uh, they're controlling this area. Yep. I'm not sure why Driver was all the way here. He was chasing the Lucian, I guess. They did get the Lucian. Pulling the Baron. You ship Pyoshik and ABA. Nice. Unfortunately, they have been separated and they will not see each other at MSI. You'll have to wait for the reunion. Oh. I think Pyoshik ended up performing pretty well towards the end of this split, but... I was also very skeptical of Omti and Pyoshik both. So... Worked out. The split. Hmm... All right, so BYG able to win this game. I think the, the key points were just not playing correctly around the, the bot lane advantage. Um, other key points, I think uh, the draft was a huge favor. Like, Husha Driver ended up kind of fucking over a lot of what they wanted to do. Um, they didn't sync out that well around mid jungle. And then... Like, what you'd want to start looking for is, again, like, the Drake deprioritization is very big, it seems. So in the next VOD, we'll see, because I think for regular season, if you take a look... Worth noting... That... So hard to find this thing. I just want to navigate towards the, the situation. Why is this so difficult? All right. So spring, worth noting, uh, PSG Town were not first place. It was CTBC Flying Oysters um, were first place. So part of the reason why we showed the earlier VODs from regular splits and PSG Talon were fourth, actually. So they were two series behind uh, first place in the stage one. And then in stage two, they ended up going towards, um, they ended up placing top two in their stage. So that allowed them to qualify for the the main PCS stage, right? So this is like kind of what we're thinking of. And then spring playoffs is when you saw them do when like basically sweep the group, right? The, the SHG got swept, they swept CFO. Uh, so these are kind of the situations we're looking for, is like how they improve over time too. I mean, I think that is very valid though, because like, obviously my content tends to be more analytical, but when I produce or work for do broadcast work, 
Uh, I do think it's very important to tell storylines. I think that that's like the biggest thing that people care about. And I also think was why the, the Academy product was like very successful for a while is that we did emphasize on these uh, elements quite a bit. What am I looking for? Okay, so we watched that one. So the next is gonna be a game from the CFO series that I just mentioned, where they ended up wiping CFO. So we'll take a look at this game. I am gonna pull up the draft and probably That's why we love LPL Storytime. True. LPL Storytime is the best. Though I think you guys love LPL Storytime because you like the drama. Speaking of um, LPL Storytime, one of the Spanish casters like made a joke about how LNG underperformed because the smell of Weiwei's feet were like keeping Scout up at night, which made me remember in 2015, there was like this, this rumor because M3 kept replacing their junglers. There's this rumor that Dade in particular did not like the smell of like one of them. Uh, which is very funny to me because that like, guy thought he was just like making a joke out of nowhere but there was actually a, a rumor that was like started by a manager that that was the case which is very funny like years ago obviously not not currently so it's like it, nothing in lpl is off limits i guess uh thank you for the follows by Karan. welcome welcome Uh, okay, so we're prioritizing the rumble. So this is what I noticed happened kind of CFO, rumble prio, and then we so we're, we're, we're going for the Lucian Nami. Uh, Filios, Melios. So they were still playing this like, well, the Melio bot lanes well into the season. So this is late stage. This is upper bracket finals. So late stage upper bracket finals, they're still playing the Melio. Um, and then of course here's the Udyr into Rumble. So Udyr was banned a lot early on versus TSG, but of course Udyr was just banned a lot in general early on. Uh, Lucian Nami, if you're all winning with like E, then Rumble is very annoying to deal with. Aphelios is very annoying to deal with. Talia knockup can be very annoying to deal with. Like for me, I would say that I I I prefer CFO's draft so far. The exception being like Udir into Aphelios is a bit annoying, even though you can shred Udir with Aphelios. Uh, it's just more like the the empowered Phoenix. And then of course Oriana, good range um, against a lot of these champs. But overall, I would say I, I slightly prefer CFO's draft here. Uh, so this is an interesting game for me from that perspective. And then we've got the Akali. So we're still sticking with like the, the flanking style jumps. From Maple. All right, so it looks like they're gonna send, it's like the four bot to contest the bot wave again for a double range. Uh, PSG end up going super aggro, multiple sums burned. So we have two AD sums, two support sums. Um, I would assume that this is like more punishing and that CFO can maybe take advantage of this discrepancy. Uh, no one dies, that's important. Also, no one drops ward, so no one gets bush control here. It looks like uh, Nami is gonna stay here. 
So they're playing for lane 2v2 start. Uh, looks like in the chaos. See if I got a word on enemy red. And enemy blue ward. So both junglers should kind of know where the other is starting. Looks like Xin Zhao will path up, take advantage of like top lane being somewhat volatile. And Wukong will path down because Lushinami should get prio. Aphelios level 1 is very weak. They spot Karsa on the tri brush, and then they do have a lane ward. Uh, there will be ads in a minute and 30. I will strategically be using the restroom at that timing. So. Um, uh, Talia is, wow, that was, that was nice punish from, uh, from Gory there. Okay, John John with the wraparound, looking for it. They did get the wave in. So, basically on the bounce, CFO end up going for base. And they, they're up in tempo before first drake again. So this is like, again, basically enemy bot lane even is dictating when they get base. And we're s like, this is the 5.30 timing, which is very relevant. And we're not hovering mid either. Or, oh, we're hovering mid as PSG so that a collie can get base and come back. If a collie gets base and comes back with item for like ulti timing, that's really good. I don't think that they're fully getting the wave in. Oh, nice knock up. Uh, ad will be starting soon, guys. When the ad starts, I will go ahead and do a quick bathroom break uh, so no one misses anything and do a coffee refresh. <laughs> so CFO has full bot side vision control. Uh, Jinjaw can contest on this one though, so Maple did not get base off, it looks like, but he does still have six, is matching. They can't contest because Aphelios, Melee are getting prior and rotating. It's actually so interesting, like, Karsa versus Maple, Sword Art versus Betty, I guess. It's not that iconic, but it's something. Chinjaw with the flash. Damn. Oh, this is huge. Double kill for Maple. So they go back to the wave. This wave is pushing out, so Botlin can no longer rotate. Oh, I said I was going to use the restroom. Okay. Well, look at this fight when I come back. Um, thanks for sitting through the ads. Obviously helps a lot. Uh, I have refreshed my coffee and we're good to go. So we wanted to look at this window, right? So Gory ends up cutting off Jendra from Maple. Maple can still E over the wall, keep in mind. Uh, Maple ends up just straight up flashing. Jendra buys time with uh, Clone. And then you have E, so they can't dash across. Maple ends up using R to catch out. He has E on Karsa here, backs over, hits both with Q, auto, second R. And then he's in Shroud and can just basically 
at will, Q, secure the final kill. So, uh, well played in skirmish from Mabel. Now he's very strong. Um, that PSG win is illegal. Uh, this is a 3-0. So he didn't get base off. He now has base off. They, what, what the fuck happened there? We see replay. We see the coach comes, and then for some reason, Gory is dying again. Gory is not negative gaming, guys. Maple gets free plate. I don't know, he's contesting the Drake when enemy bot has Pryo. Wukong has six. Or wait, did Wukong have six there? There's no way, right? There's no way. Oh, he gets six. Okay, okay. It's like there's no way he had six when he goes for the fight because otherwise that's just so grief. He didn't have six. Okay, okay. Woof. I was scared for a sec. He, he leveled up on the Drake. That is That is really sad. Because then he could have gotten out if Lucian hovered, but uh, because he gets the knockup from the, the Wukong ult, it's just fucked. <coughs> oh, that makes it less. That makes it less egregious. It's fine, guys. It's chill. Um, Lucian Nami pushing out bot. Maple hovering jungle, they have a ward on this side, so they'll see if Talia tries to, to go for like a play on through the jungle. Um, they are like with mid advantage now, playing for bot side control much better this game. So I think that that's probably a key is like this game, I would guess like for their playoffs run, they were able to play more for with mid jungle advantage and extend it to bot lead. But we'll have to kind of check that out in the next series or the next game and then go back and do some more digging based on our findings. <clears throat> nice. He ease all the way to follow the TP. Pog. The sword art guy he seems good. Could be, could be. He's very loud, allegedly. So he's got that going for him. I'm also a big sword art defender. There were definitely some things he did, BTS, that were very funny. Uh. Yes, exactly. Big Vegas fan. I'm pushing out bottle the way. Looking for recall. Rift Herald is up. I'm curious if, because they also have secured two Drakes now, right? Curious if Drake, Rift Herald matters to them at all. It does apparently matter to them. They ended up ro rotating bot lane up fully for it. This is so weird though. Like this sequence is so strange because they have Udyr here. They pulled, they have four. Akali has TP. 
You have word here, at the very least. I think you want to kite it up here. So that if they walk up, a collie can TP flank. This is weird because they kite down. Uh. I'd assume they'd want to kite up also because so Audra could tank whatever. I don't know if they just didn't see the TP or something, but they basically just like let Audra get cut off here. I think many things are solved by them cut kiting up the rift, but it's whatever. Your pitches forward, a colleague gets bought with. They use Rift Herald here. Udir basically solo zones. Karsa now no ulti. So, very important Karsa no ulti. They should go top on this wave for control and then. Is Akali soloing Drake? No way, right? No, okay, okay. It's just like, what the fuck? She's on the Drake. So, like, because Udir should go top. There's no mid wave after this, so Udir can show on top wave and Akali can show on bot wave simultaneously. Um, yeah, if Helios is on this, this is fine. See, and now that those waves are gone, Lucian can get this bot wave high. Everyone's on reset. Udyr is kind of staying, looking for this cheeky, like, catch as well. So this is something Audra seems to do as a lot, is, like, fake his bases. Um... Practically speaking, this just means top laners should be aware. Uh, thank you for the follow, Cole15. Welcome, welcome to the stream. Kali's gonna get the spell wave. Interesting. Okay. Sorry, I was just checking the, the music real quick. It seems to be stuck on this song in like infinite loop, but I don't mind it. It's chill. <laughs> Bot wave all the way into T1. Call over the wall. Uh, dr I mean, good engage look by Jendra. Kali looks for flank here. I don't think you can realistically get a flank here. It should be weird positioning. I think he'd do like a wrap around on this side. <laughs> if anything. But it's fine. They just forced them out of the pit. So there's no actual fight happening and I mean... Yeah, they could have definitely kind of like zoned them out of this fight better. Yeah, now he's like looking for a flank when there's control on this side and no one got mid wave. So CFO will get mid wave for free and mid mid T1 for Drake. Because you could, in theory, like if we look at this particular sequence. The, th the reason why I did not like the way that they played it
is here at this window. You get the, the mid wave. A colleague can get this bow wave. And push all the way in. A colleague can walk into jungle here. They get this ward. Kali could still be in try. He doesn't even kill the pink, so there's no point in him rotating and showing on the pink. So here he can go super deep, right? But as soon as he walks over this bush, Rest rotates. So Rest telegraphs that they know because this bush is warded. Uh, so then Akali doesn't like want to be in this. He also killed because it was like a it was like a zombie ward, so he killed the ward. But now he's thinking maybe it's like there's more wards here that I don't know about, right? So he kills the zombie ward. He's thinking maybe there's more wards here that I don't know about, so I don't want to go too deep. And then he ends up walking up here. So they spot him again. In my opinion, like, okay, yes, you can kill this pink here. You have control, but now that you do this, you should try the wraparound again. If he has sweep, that's like especially good. But he's so scared. I think he's like so scared that there's more wards there because they haven't controlled it. But if he goes deeper in the jungle, and they like play for flank here because Carson is so low. Carson no ulti on this window. Uh, Rumble no ulti. I think you can just legit chase them and look for flag here. And like the fight is hard winning with a Kali ult and Lucian Nami ult. But instead they back out and pull Drake. And then it's like Betty and, and Woody zoning here. And they let them lock in. And Akali's not in position where she can get a good flank off. I don't know. I think they could have definitely just like completely choked CFO out of the jungle. It's Kali on this bow wave. Ever been good as this version of Chovy? I don't know what you mean. I think Knight has had a lot of very, very strong domestic performances, if that's the question. But I think, like, if you want to go for someone who's just been, like... insanely dominant as a single player it's like either i would i would shout out either like ben or 369 probably ben 369 is also very good and it's not even like chovy is unilaterally dominant right like there are a lot of like faker i i would say faker had some performances that were better than chovy in the grand final i think he got outperformed by his top laner keen as well in the grand final so Trophy's like very good domestically, yes, absolutely 100%. But I don't, I'm not quite sure what the context of the question is. Because I think it's like, yes, Trophy's very good. But is Trophy like 1v5ing every game? No. Um, but he is very good, very oppressive, very good laner. I would say that Knight, like, if you want an equivalent, Knight is like a, a decent equivalent because I would say like Knight was my season MVP because he was unilaterally winning every game even in bad matchups. So from that perspective, I think like he's decent stuff for Jovi. I think Knight clutched the fuck up in the upper bracket final and was the main reason they won it. Um, the game four and five. So it depends on like what you mean by the question, I guess. See, like we had this discussion on um, making the rounds, and I think the the main conclusion we had was, yes, uh, 
Trovi has performed extremely good, but I can't even say that he's the best player in the world because in terms of like individual impact because Faker exists. I think Faker at times there's definitely an argument to say that he was like more dominant in the context of his role and his region in the early days of his career than Trevi was, but it's hard to say because it depends on what your metric is. Because I, I still maintain that League isn't like an insane mechanical game. Alright. We're going in deep. It's on the side of Shun. Mabel goes... Mabel's positioning is a little weird here, but he stays on the edge of uh, Shroud. Wanna see how this plays out again. So the ult was very good from rest. Uh, in terms of who it hits, like it forces uh, Drenda ba back and Betty back. So Betty has like a hard time hitting and then Gory shows up right away to kill them. So they don't have DPS anymore. And Maple ends up being like 1v3 versus the front line, so he can't get like a, an easy kill off after killing Shun, and he also used his cooldowns there, so Gory is able to do more DPS at that point. So yeah, I think the, the ult from Rust and the flank from Gory were very good. Well, Yamato and I Will Dominate can have that opinion if they want, but I think Faker still has the ability to see things on the map that almost no one else does. And his team still see things on the map that almost no one else does, and he still has like insanely clutch moments. So I, I'm going to have to disagree, because I don't feel like Faker has been outscaled. Like, Faker's big contribution was map impact. But I will dominate and Yamato can say that if they want. But I definitely disagree. <laughs> yep, I mean he is the GOAT for sure. I think like the big difference is and you can break it down. Um like, the fact that T1 identify what, like, really capitalize on Windows to pull and then turn fights is, like, a huge shout out to them, right? I think the fact that Genji need mid hover, like, on every rotation is, like, a good thing that Chovy does, but also makes his map read really, map movements, like, really predictable compared to Fakers. And, like, a lot of times teams will abuse that. I think it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, I think his individual team fighting is really good, but it's not like Genji is terrible at team fighting. I think like both soul winners are really good at it. Um, I think La uh ends up Basically, Lahens ends up buying a lot of space in terms of frontlining um, and control for the game. Like, that to me was also like a huge undersold thing is you would not be able to get a good flank angle versus Genji in most fights because of Lahens' positioning. So, I don't know. It's I did hear a lot of people like say that Chovy is just the god, 
And I think he had a better individual performance in the, the HLE series for sure, but I don't think he was the primary reason that Gen G beat T1, if that makes sense. What's my top five of all time? Honestly, that's like a really hard one to say because I have a lot of like nostalgia bias uh, for individual performance. And I think part of that is because team play was worse. Like this is something that's also very huge is I think team play was worse in um, early days of league so players stood out more as individual carries so if you're talking about like standout individual performers then early day league i would actually say it's like the inverse like early day league had way more standout individual performers than current day league a lot of current day league it's like very good performances from teams and team systems and how they play together uh, whereas I would say like individual league standout performers, that's like early days. So I'll always like talk about people like Wei Xiao, uh, stuff like that. Um, but if you are someone who says that like individual performances were worse, because I feel like the mechanics and the visualization of fights, which is like how I would mostly talk about individual performance in absence of like understanding intangibles or an absence of looking at map reads and just look at those things then like i don't think that has improved over time i think individual like team fight performance has not improved that much it's kind of stagnated what has improved is like map reads uh rotations uh those types of coordination so it's like for me it's not fair to say like someone would not have been as is like way better now mechanically than they would than they would have been let then i think that that's kind of a weird one because your ability to control your character like i would say that that's like something that stayed pretty constant yes there are certain interactions that you can play out better yes people are coordinating fights better so if you want to stand out you have to like be very smart but that also means that you're relying on your teammates to help create space for you a lot more reliably um as well so that's like kind of where i am on it i think if I had to go for like best individual performances, longevity matters a lot to me. Uh, Faker for sure, I think is up there. Let's see. Um, who else? I mean, like it's it's worth mentioning Shaohu just because he's been like consistently on top teams for so long uh let's see like support players are harder there's been a lot of fluctuation i would say like mata had always very defined teams and good individual performances for sure he's up there mako though if you have to like do support subjectively like i don't think mako has equal in any regions it's definitely an interesting one uh ad's like i will still shout out prey until the end of the world uh there's a lot of there's like a lot of really good ADs, but in terms of like overall game impact, Prey was huge. Uh, score in terms of longevity and just like the impact he had on the region as a jungler. Let's see who else. I mean, Canyon's getting up there for me. Like I know he's had like a couple of really bad years, but I just like really like the way that Canyon jungle is. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot. I'd have to really think about it if I did a definitive top five. I don't like have a definitive top five off the top of my head. I think it's like the thing about Xiaohu and Faker is I think that they're in similar categories where it's like they haven't had amazing standout individual lane performances in their careers but their teams are always s the best have the best way to play the map like almost always 
uh, in the context of their region. I'd say that right now is an exception. I think Genji played the map a bit better. But I think there's still something that T1 does better than they do, which is like the Baron pull, which was something I identified like super early in the patch notes, which is like Baron terrain is so fucking abusable. So the fact that T1 can just get a map state set up every map state and even draft to pull Baron in turn, like every time they draft, it's to, to kite at Baron. They, they want to kite you in open river at Baron. And that's like, as soon as you understand that that is how they're drafting, their drafts make way more sense. So, yeah. I don't know. T1's very interesting to me. Right now. And I think that the way that they play is also more reliably simple over repeated series. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's very curious. Caps? Maybe. Yeah, I think it's worth putting caps in there. It's very interesting because you can debate, like, who had more impact on that team, caps versus perks, uh, when they were at their peak. I think having them both on the roster was, like, insanely good, and unfortunately, we could not get that going forward. Um, We also had, like, a really nice meta for perks to play AD. And I know perks is, like, considered falling off but yeah obviously caps like individual performance you'll point to but it's another one of those where it's like okay if you if you had to point to the the, the goat map play giant of the region it's like probably caps at this point people will believe because he's been the constant on the team but he for sure like learned a lot from perks so it's hard to say very interesting though to like watch the development of players like that because you could also say like ming has usually has like his teams usually have good macro but he probably learned a lot from like shaohu anyway psg won that fight and i think caps is it's fair to put like one of caps or perks up there i think it's fair I think for 2019 alone, it's like hard to make the argument though, because it's like you're basically putting them up there for 2019 alone, you know? That was like when they insanely peaked. And saying that 2019 is important enough to put someone uh, on like an all time top five list, I don't know, hard to say. Like, I'd have to think about it more, right? Like, if there's enough names that you can justify putting someone for, like, insane 2019 peak on the list, sure. Otherwise, like, you have to look at people uh, who were consistently performing at the top of their game for more time. Rookie is, I think, a better argument than a lot of others. Because I think Rookie is just always individually performing well. And he's always on teams that, like, it feels like those teams go, like, drop, like, 10 placements if he's not on them, you know? <laughs> it's what it feels like. <laughs> All right, anyway, back to the PSG VOD review. Twenty twenty one, he was not bad in twenty twenty one. That's crazy. 2023, I can accept. 2021, I watched every single game of LPL that year, and Rookie was not bad. He was actually the best, is like the best this year in the league. Played very well, I think. Like people were giving Rich insane amount of props, and I feel like it was just, just crazy. 
This is just crazy talk. Anyway. That's when we had the meme on stream when we did the the live views, which was like rookies so washed he's clean. Yeah, 2021 he was on IG. Rich on V5 in 2022, but I think 2021 he was still so good. I still had him like I have the old VOD where I had him as top. Cause that was the that was also the split yeah uh that we had top Xiaohu. And Rookie was my number one mid laner in the ranking that split. 2021 IG. I remember. Because that was when I did like the, the montage. And I also remember that playoffs where IG were like bottom team in playoffs. But they still like took two games off of RA. And I remember uh like Wink randomly getting caught, no one pressuring anything. <coughs> this is where the shy was like playing Scion and taking credit for all the macro. This was also when they had Shun, and Shun was getting ridiculously hyped, but if you actually watched the mid skirmishes, Rookie was like carrying the 2v2s really hard in terms of like his individual execution. And Shun was getting like all the credit for it for some reason, because this was Shun's rookie split, and he only really had good games on Middle E. Yeah, I remember that. That was a good time. Yeah, they don't improve macro-wise, but like for example, like the IG macro is just like play three three lanes, super aggressive, and you'll get a better trade if someone collapses on you on one side. Um, that's been pretty much always it. I think that's not true of NIP this this year though. I think NIP actually had a lot of good macro improvement. And I don't know if it's like coaching staff. I know they gave draw a lot of credit, weirdly, for like their lane swaps and stuff. But even outside of the lane swaps, they I think had like a lot better map play than expected in certain situations. I would say that their side landing is kind of bad, but the way that they set up for drakes is good. So I think it's not true this year, if that makes sense. Anyway, we're getting very distracted from the PSG VOD review. But that's kind of normal. Akali on top. So this is where you want to play like the flank side, which makes sense because you're pushing top. So this is like more typical of what their their Drake play is, which is you push out all the way to the last second and then you look for flank angle for retake. Obviously here they are on the Drake because they're giga ahead, but this is more like how they were playing it early season where they've always still the last possible second to join the fight. Um, they also have Soul here, which is not typical of them in the, the earlier games that we saw. They were basically ignoring Drakes until like third Drake. Even when they had Bopryo. Who do I think will win MSI? Uh, right now I have TS, but I want to study the patch more and watch their finals. <clears throat> uh, Betty has been arguably the most sus player on this theme from the games that we've seen so far, but we've only watched four games, so we'll just keep we'll keep going for a bit.
So this was the final, which was which the game that we'll watch next is a game from the final. So the interesting thing about, which I've already said, about PSG's run is that they basically swept Upper Rec Final and Grand Final after not necessarily having an insane uh, regular season run. They actually like placed fourth in the regular season and only like in the, the qualifier group or like the stage one, uh, they, they like came in as second seeds for the playoffs. Then they swept CFO. And then this was the, the grand final against SHG. Um, so part of the, the things that we saw that were different from this, the CFO and the regular season games from what we've watched so far is in regular season, they had very low Drake Cryo. And they were not pressuring bot lane leads. They're still not pressuring bot lane leads, but they were also not playing with their mid jungle duos. I think their mid jungle duo was like key to them winning the CFO game and like playing together through that. But their bot lane, like they're still not playing well around prior bot lanes, and it feels like they're just giving themselves prior bot lanes so that bot lane doesn't get dumpstered or something like this. It's very funny. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> We'll see how they go. I think Woody has been okay, but Betty has been very whatever. Um, we'll see how they do in the finals. So in this one, they're actually going for... Part of the reason why I chose this one is because they, they just like blind smolder here. Uh, which... I want to see how they play with like blind smolder. Which... Because every other game, they seem to hard prio... Uh, bot, uh, bot control, and like that's why you're you're seeing like Callista Lucian band against them one two three. Uh, yeah, so it, it it'll be interesting. We'll see how they play with it, because this is another one where they have like a very clear like we're playing through mid jungle kind of setup with Karma Shinjao. Um, Team Heretics? Kind of. It depends on... Oh, you mean like the in terms of legacy players? I guess, but it was like interesting to see CFO versus PSG because you had like Sword Art versus Betty, which you can argue whether or not the Betty was like the GOAT or not of the Sword Art of the, the Flash Wolf days. And then you had Maple versus Karsa. So I would say like if you're using that, it's could kind of make the argument, but also there were some non-legacy players on both teams. Old Patch on top of that, yeah. I mean, I don't think Patch mattered too much in terms of the change in what they're prioritizing. Um... Okay. I mean, Audra, I've kind of liked. I wouldn't say he's been like an insane standout, but he's been decent enough. Like, I like the the plays. Like, Audra goes for like a lot of tempo greed plays in the games we've seen so far, where he like fakes back and tries to like, to catch out enemy top, which is kind of cool. Uh, he'll definitely catch out a lot of top laners if they don't study his vods doing stuff like that. Um, mid lane hover from both. So this is this does end up being like a Camille sport game, but from Vista. So they end up giving up um, initial prio here, at least a little bit on wave one. They should be able to get it back though. Marbites just spamming bombs. Yeah, they hit two first. Interesting, yeah, it's like Vista missed some XP, it looks like. Um, so he, like, otherwise you would position very forward here as Camille, because you're going to hit two first. Like, if he hits two on this timer, then Woody could die. <laughs> Unironically. Woody or Betty, theoretically, but most likely Woody, because you just get instantly, you get stunned by E. 
So we'll probably E back, but if he's level one, he can't do that. He has to W away. Or flash. But he'll at least burn us um. Yeah, here he's able to react more because he has W and E. And then he's walking like the, the E from Vista here. Important to note. Z Ziggs is back clicking when Vista E's in, so there's no ability to trade damage. He also has Q down, so there's like no damage follow up possible. Um, and he just goes in for 1v2 trade, which is why Camille gets low there. Uh, here we go, we've got. Nice knock up! From Jenja. Jenja's like played Shinja very well. Uh, also, like, we've mostly just seen him play Xinjiao and, and Maokai. So Dasher had to flat out, flash out. Oh, nice. Nice knockout from uh, Rek'Sai. Followed by the double kill from Maple. This is also the first time we've seen Maple play like non-flanking champ, just like a poke-based control mage. But he's starting out early with like a double kill, so we'll see. We'll see <laughs> how he plays it in fights because you can't play the way he has been playing, which is like to push out one side all the way and then TP in for flank. You can't play it like this. Um. Jinja gets all the grubs. We're on top, looking. Try a double knockup. Um, notice also Smolder is just like able to stack for free. No one is contesting him, no one is pressuring him with the Camille. They're basically just playing Camille to rotate for side, but they're not able to pressure with the, the TF and mid has kind of lost ability to do anything because Karma already has lost chapter. So if Camille wants to do something, she should be pressuring on top side. But it's very hard to, to like dive the smolder post six because he'll just ult to clear the wave. I uh, also don't have a shit ton of damage follow up until Ziggs gets a lost chapter, which he now has. So he can maybe look for it, but one thing that they could do is they could have Camille hover this top side. Get pressure out, like, and then potentially Eevee could shadow bot off of that rotation. Evie does not have uh, TP or ult though, worth noting. Cause that would be one way to play against the smolder here. Cause if you gold card him off wave, then like being bot doesn't mean anything. Then being like undiveable under turret doesn't mean anything, right? They did not, yeah, I mean, they they should not be up, right? The biggest thing was that Aja got, like, pressure from Skirmish and then went for Skirmish, but it felt like Evie was just, like, a non-factor, and he's just getting completely run in this lane, you know? I don't think... Jungle pathing ends up changing because Aja even like tried to cheese level one on on mid wave. I could go back and look, but yeah.
But almost always, jungle should pat down for the SHG and then pat that for, for PSG. Because in this dynamic, even if jungle is pathing up, TF will always get the wave, get first crash, should always get first crash. Back off on the rotation when jungle is topside, and then his jungle will path down. Uh, look for something with Camille Hell of Blades. They'll recall, and then he'll hover topside, and then that's when Evie can set up a top play. But that's typically how the dy dynamic will go. It did not go that way this game, in terms of like how the top lane matchup went. All right. Gage. They should still win this, but like going for all in with Ziggs Vi versus. And this is just a like I don't know. This is it's so hard to kill kill here because you've got Karma Shield, you've got Ulti. And then you're forcing like your AoE plus Vi ult at the same timing window. Uh, trying to like CC lock the Shin Jazz so he can't use ult, but he just uses like Karma just uses shield, he survives it, and then he nullifies damage and ults after. Unlucky. Hitting bot side. Audra goes for flank kill. So now we've respawned and we're getting grubs on top. So this is just like a stop game, to be honest. Even with like bot is kind of a non-factor, but we're playing through mid jungle. Uh, we're hovering mid more often as jungle, which is like the big difference, I think, so far in their early game between the playoff series where they're winning and what was happening in regular season. And they're also prioring Drake's a lot more. I think that's pretty significant. Damn. So I kind of want to watch this and see how they execute it. I know they're super ahead already, but I just want to see. Okay, so he uses this to, to spot everyone. Nice interrupt from Forest. He should die for this. Uh, Evie can now kite. I, I think it takes Evie a bit too long to like back click and start autoing, but he at least evades the, the Shin Dao Q doing that. And then Vista comes up. Now Shin Dao is just sitting here, not taking damage. Maple's here. Yeah, there's not much to do. I think. I think SG, SHG actually didn't play that situation badly. They're just they just can't win it. They can't win it because mostly because Shin Jowalt with Karma is just too broken right now, considering the mid jungle is ahead. All right, we're just flipping the Raptors, I guess. Uh, full top side control. I mean, it is very impressive that uh, see that uh, SHG is like in the finals for qualification for MSI, though. You love to see it. Full top side control. They push out all the way. So this is what I wanted to see because like you have karma, so you have to play the scenario differently. They're still waiting until like 30 seconds, which is fine. But also worth noting because they're like fully a match. And they get this pick off to the side when they see everyone appearing on the top vision. So SHG matching on top side. Um lets them get bot side control for free. They're also dropping rift here. I don't think they need to drop rift unless it's expiring. 
<coughs> but they're dropping Rift, and then, like, Audra could have TP'd there regardless. They get the, the control. They're going to rotate down for Drake now. Most likely. As soon as TF shows on this wave, they can pull Drake. Yep, there it is. Uh, Maple's gonna catch wave. Rakan already has wards inside of bot jungle. Uh, SHG weren't really able to effectively clear out top jungle, so they have control on both sides. Now they see SHG on their wards, killing their wards, so they should rotate to top side, but this is a very weird engagement vista. Uh, I guess they're playing for TP and they're willing to give this top T2. Honestly? If Dasher TPs to this, I say like give as PSG, I would say give Woody back out and then just like let them Okay, never mind. They win 4v5. GG. Smolder Smolder has the stacks. Vista is not playing a real tramp. And Smolder has the stack, so they went 4v5. But I would say, like, normally, we can give Woody back out here and play for topside. I want to see this fight, though, because I feel like they should be able to do slightly better than this. It must just be... Uh... Ziggs burst not connecting, or... So they ult here on Woody. And then Forest changed target from Woody to uh, Maple when there's like not really follow up damage. Evie doesn't have gold card either, so he's just autoing. Maple buys a lot of time with shield, does eventually get knock up from Tulia. Vista, well, is now forced out of the fight. He's not real. Uh, here comes Junja ulti was like very very good i think in terms of control here almost save mabel but he can buy a lot of time with his ult now and betty rotates to the fight wow he doesn't even land his spells that's crazy camille just dies yeah I mean, it wasn't even particularly pay played insanely well from PSG, and they still went 4v5. That's that's nuts. It's whatever. Um, now they're 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 on top side, so their rotations are good in terms of timing, overall. Mm, ads will start at 1.30. We'll probably just move on from the VOD when the ads starts. Because I assume the game's like almost over. And then um, I will refresh my copy again and we'll start looking at like other games to kind of shore up what we learned. Interesting. I mean, Audra just lives forever, no? And then they just go mid. Well. Zigzolt doesn't really connect. Yeah. I appreciate it. I respect it. But Smolder gets so much time and then the rest collapse. GG's. Game over. So yeah, it feels like they aren't putting as much emphasis on their bot lane getting prio in recent memory, or in, in the recent games, they're putting way more emphasis on mid jungle syncing up, which is more what I expect from like a team with Maple on it, but they did have a lot of emphasis on jumps like Callista, and I don't think they used it well is the problem.
All right, ads in progress. We'll go ahead and we'll transition to the next game. And we'll take a look at what some of the like last pods we'll watch on the stream and decide how we want to handle it. <laughs> okay. We are back. So, what we learned so far, guys. Uh, let's see. Do I have... i close this. In terms of what we learned so far, we can say the following. PSG. Um, regular season, so PSG hypothesis, right? Regular season to playoffs, improved, um, mid-jungle timings for plays, uh, more focus on Drake takes, and... That's like kind of the main thing. I think um, still bot lane, landing timings, pressure still questionable, um, and then uh, focus on Drake retakes. Unless Soul is pressured, I think. So like they're they're playing to retake Drake setup over proactively. So we'll we'll say that that's that's kind of like what they're doing. Um, I think also we we mentioned top lane, uh, fake recalls and tempo drops frequently. So I think all of these things are things that we kind of like noticed that we can still test a bit more. Uh, main things I would like to look at if we're looking at these things then are situations where let's like look at their Drake priority. So overall considering it's like Drake's killed lost that very low like ocean and cloud priority it looks like and higher these ones. I'm also curious if we can see like difference in Drake priority from regular season to so let's see playoffs, TCS playoffs. So we see these. Let's see TCS spring. Alright, so we have like lower in all categories. Higher blue side win rate, so by quite a bit. So maybe we should watch more red tech games. Uh, let's see, champs. 80% win rate, 66%, 100% with smolder. So it makes sense to me that they would, despite having like high emphasis on like prior bots, because with Clist they can also deny uh, Drake takes, even if you don't prior them. Um, we should try to watch like an Azir game, maybe. Because those won't exist in the playoffs because they played on 
on, let's see. So with that information in mind, what can we watch? Um, for looking for Azir games, so there's this one, which is BYG. There's this, there's this one versus CFO. Kind of watch this one because we didn't see them play CFO regular season. Um, didn't play CFO regular season. We also. I also said uh, maybe we can watch. They did lose to SHG. They lost playing Lucian Nami. I feel like if they have to pressure bot lane with their drafts, if they have like a gr aggro bot lane and need to win bots with their drafts, they will not do well. Is my current hypothesis. Uh, let's see. We'll watch two more bots, so I'm very curious. We wanted more red side games, right? I think. Did, did I choose a red side game here? With the Azir loss? Yes, I did. So I can choose another red, though. Uh, Dead Huey, and then Lushinami versus Smolder. So I kind of want to watch these two. Um. All right, so this is CFO PS2 regular season. CFO were the first place team. Uh. I think it's unlikely at this point. It's not completely out of the question, but I think it's unlikely that Danny will come back based on the information I have. Um, but it's not out of the question, I don't think. I don't think people should stop asking about it, if that makes sense. If you were a Danny fan, as long as you're not malicious about it. Um... Okay, here we go. We've got four. Woody gets trapped. So this must be like a telegraph level one from them. If Woody stands in, the, or someone on PSG stands in this spot a lot. So that's what you would look at now if you're preparing for them. Is to see how frequently like someone stands in that spot for PSG, so the line line brush invade works. It's a cute little level one for CFO. Oh, uh, it's a very good argument for that to be the case, yeah. Rest gets chunked. But again, I think longe longevity does matter a lot. So, in terms of like if you're building a legacy list, <laughs> pushing out bot all the way. We have one word over the wall. Push that mid from Talia. Let's see if they prioritize Drake. Cause this is like a pretty early thing, but they also shouldn't have Drake prio with these matchups on bots. Especially with Woody giving up flash and uh, first blood. To TF. So Betty gets window, standing mid. So they are trying to get Maple base. Uh, versus Gory here. 
So this is like kind of what I'm talking about when I mentioned it before. It's like if you have a strong level six mid who peaks here, looking for base. Um, like between minute four and five, so that when you get to lane, you have good item buy and <coughs> you hit six on the 530 wave and can set up a play. Usually when you see something like this, supports and jungles will ro all rotate mid to either prevent it or enable it. And here we have like Azir versus Talia, and Talia would normally get the base. They're trying to use the fact that Betty is here first. Unfortunately, uh, we get a collapse off from CFO because their, their mid jungle duo should be stronger. Turnout should also be stronger. Oh, Jindad did get reset though, so like him getting reset is nice, but still, they, they should still win this. Um, so yeah, CFO end up like basically... So Maple still gets back to lane first, but Gory will have an advantage now on the 6th window. He did miss part of this wave though, because his jungle support pushed it out. So that could impact the time when he levels up to level 6. Yeah, he's he's not getting it on this wave. Oh no, he did just get it. Okay, okay. He just got it like a couple greets late. Um, but the kill goal, the the kill XP helped. Um, they end up getting this, so they're doing very well. I mean, it just looks kind of like PSG sort of gets stomped here. Um. PSG, they're pushing this wave very, very fast because they're using support timer to guarantee that they get the wave in. This means that Junja gets bot scuttle. Maple doesn't want to back, so he's going to be at a bad spot because it's Fiendish Codex versus Lost Chapter. He does base with Coco. Okay, okay. Okay, that's good. I was like, this is weird. But he does just push out the wave. I, I assumed he wouldn't base because, yeah, he can't buy, like, an item. He can only sit on components. He has Blasting Wand, Fiendish, versus Lost Chapter, which is not the best. Blasting Wand will, will help him, like, kill the wave more efficiently, though, for sure. So we have full words on top side. Um, so far, I think the more most interesting thing about them is um, how they play Rethex for Drake. I think Fly actually have a very similar approach to Macro intuitively, which is interesting. Um, I'm wondering because they also played their finals on 45 and they were not really playing during the, the lane swap craze, the, the lane swap fever. I feel like lane swapping will also drastically benefit them considering how they're playing with bots. Uh, I'm hoping like they're they're just like infinitely worse at using like mid lane timers with jungle, even though they did improve it a lot for, for playoffs. And again, like they're not really prioritizing Drake's they have a Drake. Like, a Drake has been taken, but no one, it seems, like, prioritized Drake in early season. Like, the top teams, it seems like, didn't prioritize Drakes in early season of PCS, which is interesting to me. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. We'll see this, and we'll watch the other red side games, because it seems like their red side win rate is significantly lower than their blue side win rates and we'd have to i'd have to like look more closely at their drafts to understand why that is if we have time because i will have to ff in about 50 minutes <laughs> so if we get through the two vods then we can look at their draft trends more closely and see like why we might think they struggle with red sides 
based on their strengths uh, that we've seen in the games they've played. Okay, mm so I have full control here. From CFO, they're walking up. They get they have positional advantage on both midwave and strike here because of the TF pressure. Uh, center roaming instead, and then Woody can't like match TF push, so they get the Drake, but they're not looking for fight. This is interesting that um, CFO don't want to turn for this fight. It's because of the, the TP top. They don't want to pull rest TP. Uh, especially not until he gets this wave, so they'll at least stall time. Q over the wall. Uh, gold cards. Wow, this guy went very deep. Damn. Maple went very deep there into Tri Brush. Like, you should know because Gory hasn't used E yet either. So, this is very interesting. Definitely feels like desperation. You're like solo trying to engage into into um Tri Brush when Talia has unraveled Earth cooldown up. So that felt like a weird desperation fight. So the question is like maybe Maple feels like he has to be a primary flanker or engager, and so when he's playing like control mage and he's not spiking, like he has a Nasher's Tooth. And he's not able to get these flanks off, then maybe he struggles to f to find his place in team fights. It's possible. Again, this is like very small samples, so you keep watching VODs and you keep trying to understand like uh, if that hypothesis is true or not. Uh, I think what lane swaps will be a massive thing at MSI. I feel like having to draft lane swappable top laner makes your cops very linear. I mean, the problem is, is if you don't swap lane swap, draft lane swappable tops, and the enemy team can lane swap, your top laner just gets giga fucked. So you have to. That's the thing. And if the patch changes assassin mids, it doesn't matter because like. Ass Assassin mids will just be able to play an isolated 1v1, which means they don't have to worry about jungle pressure and they can just scale. Like, Akali can just scale. Uh, I think Silas will have a harder time because he'll have to play through 2v2. Um, but that's like usually a, an effective lane swap is that mid can just play isolated 1v1. The other element of it is like, yes, even if you're playing front to back, like mid can just play separately for flank and top laner can can uh, create space. Top lane support can tra t create space for ADC, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the thing though is if you're drafting like a one through one comp and enemy chooses to swap, then there's like literally nothing your top laner can do about it. He just gets fucked. Uh, like I think an underrated element of it is that the top lane meta is so focused on like flash uh, ghost type picks like top lane feels very safe so that's why you can play and then plus like the lane is long and wide so top lane and also safer now so top lane feels insanely safe against jungle pressure that is part of why the lane swapping is happening uh, because if you're going TF then there's like almost no way to keep TF from completely railing your top laner if he picks like a melee tramp um, so if you want to play like a Jinx comp with a front line, with Jinx and crit ADs being also super OP, then what has to happen is you have to be able to give free landing phases for not just the top la the the bot laner, but also the the top. So that's why the lane swaps will happen also because you can't just like have jungle play like Sege and then camp top because top laner burns ghost. Okay, cool. Top laner burns flash. Okay, cool. Top laner burns ghost again. Um, like, top laner doesn't care. But if you're swapping, top laner gets destroyed because he's sitting under his tower and can get 3v1s and can't farm. So that's like a way to actually punish those top lane picks is to do these lane swaps. Um, also, the fact that the turret gold 
Like, Terra's first blood gold used to be a big reason why land swaps were destroyed because on 6.15 the turret first blood gold was 400 so you get like 1k for first turret there were also no plates plates significantly slow down the taking of turrets on both sides and then you get increased turret resistances for taking a plate so taking subsequent plates like very quickly is a little bit harder than it was which means that the likelihood of you of you getting turret first blood so fast that the enemy top laner gets that the enemy dual lane on top gets nothing is very low so in my opinion, if you're going like a Jinx comp, it's absolutely 100% optimal for you to swap. Um, and it's very difficult to stop if they know what they're doing. So that's why I think swaps will still be really huge uh, at MSI. Hello, hello, see you. Awesome. I'm glad that you have enjoyed the, the Serity streams. Can Karsa make Gory look good? Uh... Objectively, that has happened in terms of like watching the the games. Uh, there's a lot of LPL rejects on both sides. But anyway, that's my very long rant about land swaps. I actually think they're optimal right now. Anyway, we'll see, we'll see. So Woody gets gold card out of the bush. We did not check the evil bush. Copyright evil bush. This bush and then this bush by Drake is the evil bush. Because there's always someone in that bush. So it is therefore evil. Well, this team did not make MSI, the CFO team, so unfortunately, maybe your trust is accurately placed. Uh, Talia pushes out mid all the way. And see if I'll get Drake. It just seems like the, the lack of care for Drakes in this region early season was like insane. Alright, so we've got Shun. Pushing out all the way. Creating good pressure. And then Talia's on Batiwan while Aatrox absorbs the pressure. I feel like you could just stay top here as CFO because they had something here as well and just kind of like I mean the problem is you don't know how many people will come here like Betty comes here for the wave and then they rotate to stop Talia push but you could maybe do something cheeky with like Vi or Xante staying here and then like over overstaying for a tempo but to try to trap someone because you know that they will go as soon as they catch this wave there's like not theoretically an easy play to make so they will immediately rotate people to intercept this so if you have someone like staying up here and like kind of cheesing then maybe that's a play angle <clears throat> I assume he knows some. I mean, he'll know some. The question is, how much is some? Who can say? But he played so much PTS, like, he has to. I don't know.
Okay, maple catching bot wave, pushing all the way. Poor Adra. That was not the window to try to temple trap in the the, the brush. <laughs> I mean, they just have control on mid, so they can go to either side there. As opposed to before when they were had like three, four bots. And we're just gonna run it down in CFO now. It looks like game's pretty over. So I think in this one, the main thing is when you, you don't have like good agency through mid, it's a lot harder for PSG to play. Uh, when you're not winning side, thank you. Thank you, STL Slayer24. Thank you for the resub. Thank you for the two months. Nice, nice, nice. Appreciate it so much. Hope you have been enjoying the PSG VOD review. <coughs> PSG is the flash row since they also often went. They actually had um, not a very dominant regular season, which we talked about earlier, in terms of like determining the differences between how they were playing uh, early season and later season. Um, I think Drake change on Drake Pryo was a huge one, uh, and then change on how they were playing their mid jungle two v twos is another one. So far. <coughs> So we have another red side game to look at, and then we'll look more critically at their drafts if we have time before I have to leave in like 25 minutes or 35 minutes. So let's take a look. Uh, it looks like they are banning like Dacian Karma. So this is back to playoffs, right? So that was like an early VOD. This is the playoffs. This was the, the actually the, the upper bracket match between SHG, which ended up being the grand final, where they 3-0'd SHG in the grand final, but in the upper bracket, it went to five games. Uh, they did lose this game, um, to my understanding, and I wanted to watch this one because one, it's a red side game, and they seem to have significantly worse water on red side. Uh, and two, they put a lot of emphasis on <coughs> um, punishing with bot lane in their draft. And that has been, that was a flaw of theirs in regular season is when they had like a, a punishable bot lane matchup, they did not execute on it well. So I want to see if that is still true in playoffs uh, towards the end. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, so, ooh dear. Ends up being high prior for them. Udyr, very commonly panned. Oh, I also wanted to watch it because he's playing Huey, which is just objectively not a flanking champ. <laughs> like, Azir could kind of be a flanking champ, but yeah, Maple Huey, I think, might be something that we can look at. Because the Azir even looked for like a desperation flank in the last game, so I want to see how he plays out the Huey. And Azir just like was not able to ever get out of side lane because he wasn't winning side. So he just always seemed like he was catching late and never leaving side. And so he was never able to play fights well. So I'm very curious to see like, because Maple was so huge for them in terms of how they were playing out their drakes uh, for retakes. So I want to see um, how he's doing when he plays like these control mages or uh, champs like this. And obviously in the Karma game we watched like he just got a double kill early, so they just played off control really well, and that was kind of a snowball game, so we'll see how this one goes. Um, they are spotted on this ward. So another thing, they, they very frequently will play for their bot lane early on level 1s to set up vision control. Uh, that's another thing that they do a lot. It seems like they, they put a lot of emphasis on playing for bot lane control without it necessarily panning out for them. Uh, so that's like a very interesting element as well for me in terms of how they play. Uh, so they get the, the level 1 ward here.
Oh, oh, the wraparound. They're not. They're not sure. So they face check. Okay. Nautilus loses aftershock, and like half of his HP. So definitely worth trade. Standing here. Okay. So this. They're playing this. This pretty far forward in lane, which we like to see. Um, especially since Vi is weaker early. You also have vision on the edge here on the Raptors, so that might give them a bit more agency. They pick this window to drop Warden Try. Let's see if they keep pressure here, because usually when they've been like winning really soundly, they'll always lose on the bounce. Even in like the Caitlyn Lux lane, they just lost on the bounce, and that was part of like enemy jungle was stronger in the 3v3. Okay, okay. They saw such path top, so they're looking for a dive here. So they actually get the dive off on the knot. Okay, cool. Uh, good to see them like actually using their volley well here. Uh, did either of these teams qualify for M MSI? PSG did. So that's why we're doing this one. Uh, so that we can like get a better read on PSG because I haven't watched them in season. So we're just doing a big PSG VOD review today. So big wave coming in. They know Vi is going to be going top, so they're not necessarily heavily contesting this since the, the jungle should be going bot. Like, you can almost always have a good read on this, and it, even if you don't, then your jungler should. Because he knows timings and clears. So they're just denying from this side of the map. This was something that I saw... I see, like, I used to see, like, Guma Yusi do a lot was like freeze more forward in the lane so that he could crash if he needed to as opposed to like buy his turret this was years ago though he doesn't do it as much anymore I will not be co-streaming MSI, unfortunately, but as far as I know, because I did, did not have the opportunity to apply, I'm not part of the League Partnership Program, so I won't be co-streaming MSI, but uh, I'll try to do some like VOD reviews and content uh, outside of peak MSI watch hours so that um, I'm still streaming. All right. And this, I, yeah, I mean, there, if I obviously like, I normally stream during what would be typical MSI hours. So yeah, I mean, we'll see what what will end up being optimal time for me to stream. I might do some uh, co-streaming during like later hours, so like later NA hours, so that, uh, or not co-streaming, but bot reviewing during later NA hours, just so that people, like I'm, I'm hitting the NACL fan base. <laughs> We'll see, because I assume it's going to be later. Um, China time, so they can hit you mornings. Kind of like um, 
The LPL playoffs now are like 3 a.m. Pacific time, which is two hours later than even like the two series days. So you're hitting at like uh, noon European time, which I expect the MSI to be like similar time zone. Nice, Forest getting kite back, Flash. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I mean, it's looking good for PSG so far. The big thing for me is like when Smolder was a big thing, I always cared way more about um, top lane control, right? I always cared more, way more about top lane snowball and whose front line was stronger. In this case, like obviously the, like your your Udyr should be end up being like stronger front line, but I mean, thinking that Renekton doesn't scale and will, won't sustain is kind of crazy. Like, diving the smolder doesn't matter too much because it unironically gives him more opportunities to auto attack and get stacks. And look, you can't set up this dive, it's like already fucked because he just ults and the wave is gone. Like, I don't know. Playing around sp punishing smolder is so hard. So he doesn't even like lose most of this wave because it's cannon. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, Renekton, of course, scales now. Like, it's anything that can build uh, BC Sterics, I think, is disgusting. He's going, like, the Eclipse build at the moment, but I assume he'll still go Sterics. Mm, we're pulling. FF, everyone's dead. Hodge is dead. So let's see how this fight goes. In more detail, slower pace. So again, PSG are kind of late to this Drake. They have some vision control set up, but they have they've recalled late later than enemy bots, so Bot can push this out all the way. They can start killing the wards, and PSG are in a position where they have to face shit. So this is like more typical what we saw from them in regular season. So Vista is zoning, Woody ends up cut off, and Vista ends up blocking out Drendra. Drendra ends up split from his team. It's just like a very split fight. Um, He goes like super deep here with the flash Q. Ends up stuns from Sejuani ulti. And in the back line here, it's like the top laners and mids. And Renekton is just doing more damage at this point with the knockout from Natalia as well. CC locking so that. Um, Maple can't even do anything. And then Renekton just runs over them in in short range, so unlucky. Like you don't have Jinja to, to peel or create space. Um, Woody can't do it, so it's literally just Adra. But Renekton is out damaging, and then plus like you get the CC lock from Talia coming out, so. Uh, Relecting can kind of live in lane swaps though, because he has good sustain and he um, clears way fast, so he can kind of live in, in lane swaps. Like, lane swaps, Relecting is pretty flexible. Uh, the problem with Renekton is that he has bad level 1. So you can almost always force uh, whatever lane assignments you want against Renekton level 1 because his level 1 is shit. So that's the, the problem with Renekton and lane swaps more than anything. 
But if the wave's coming into him and he's like under tower and he has flash up and abilities, then if he dies one time, he gets get some get some XP, get some gold, comes back, and he's okay. He's okay. As long as he just like doesn't burn flash. Like the situation we saw with the NIP swap versus FBX where he burned flash and got completely griefed and ran down by Udyr was like my god that guy trolled like uh, oh my god I, w I did not emphasize it in the video but that guy griefed so hard that should not be that bad <clears throat> he, he could have based or he could have saved flash because it's one of those I was very nice about it in the video, but it was bad. Uh, is pushing this wave. Like again, Maple, like kind of with melee range when Hui has super long range. Hui is also playing like, he's playing like to, to kind of cheat tempo a bit on sides. He's not going to get a flank off or like play well versus Renekton, so I don't know what he's looking for exactly. Alright, now he's going to come mid. Maybe he's like, this it could be possible that he's like kind of like debate the Renekton a bit. Like he stays one extra wave, uh, fakes his base, and then Renekton thinks like maybe he's still here, you know? So Renekton stays an extra wave as well before the fight. Cause that, if he's doing that, then that's like pretty good. I could see that being like the the logic. Um point here. Mabel's trying to zone. This is it. Okay, so the most of the zone control abilities from Celia here end up going not connecting, so let's see. They're able to kite this back well and disengage with Nami ult, right? Like the E, they get E from Lucian, so he doesn't get too much damage. Uh, Dasher has to flash, but Renekton gets into the back line. I think it's the biggest problem here. <laughs> like, what the fuck? How does he get over here? It's just the Blast Gun. They didn't kill Blast Gun before setting this up. So even though they ult him, look at how much he just heals. Uh, and then we have Marble coming in, Nautilus isolated. Talia is honestly just like destroying fights for PSG in so many games where they play versus Talia. It's like Jin Zhao goes too deep very consistently or something like this and then the team can't follow up because of Talia E or like that isn't what happened here but that's happened in so many fights. That's been like the case throughout the course of watching these games. It's like they don't play well against Celia is what it feels like. I don't know, Miracu. What did you just watch? That fight should have gone well for PSG because suddenly SHG was like chasing into them, but they didn't kill the blast gun, so Renekton got into backline for free. And even here they could just kite up. Like even here they could just kite up, but for some reason like, Audra runs forward. Audra doesn't need to run forward here. They can kite back. They can even give this Drake. Because it looks like SHG are going to chase. But if they don't chase, you could just give this Drake and then your wave is bouncing back. So you could just push it out and get top two on. But, like, considering all the resources SHG burned here... So, no Q? Plus TP? Plus Talia ult? If Aja doesn't get caught here, then I feel like it's really nice. Yeah, he gets knocked up by the Talia. If he just like kites back and forces them to chase, or like forces them to, to go around and go through the Drake on this side, which they could also do, then I think it's possible. Uh, I think Maple on immobile range traps is sus. 
I think he needs to be playing like side lane flank jumps. For the way that uh for the way that PSG set up Drake's, I think Maple needs to be playing flank jumps. That's like legit what's carrying most of their Drake fights when they win them, because they play Drake's for retakes. Um, they very rarely have positional advantage on them. They're very low, late rotating for Drake's generally. But this one wasn't even bad. Like, we can watch it again. Because they actually had positional advantage here. And Vi pull. Like, Nautilus Burn's Q, and then this would be an angle where it's like, if Udyr is here, then you can walk forward. This would be like where you can walk forward as long as you're not getting separated. But now it's like, okay, we have to kite back on this situation because Udyr is here late. But I think if you just kite back here because so many resources were used and PSG are still so healthy, they should fucking win. I don't know, it's crazy. Evie just gets him to backline for free. Sag. But this, yeah, like this Drake was actually like Maple did something fun on top side, which made Renekton rotate late, but Udyr was not here on time, which is a big thing. Because Udyr kind of has to zone. And now you have Smolder for SHG. I did, we watched, so we've kind of jumped around. Uh, we did watch one game from the Grand Finals already. But I like to, when I do VOD reviews, I like to jump around and look at different games uh, for different, like, conditions. Um, so we watched some earlier season games. We watched uh, a couple games from playoffs already. And then, like, a couple of things we noticed made me want to watch games where Maple's playing mages. Or, like, immobile non-flankers basically and then more red side games and also more games where like betty and woody are uh having like agency over enemy bot lanes so that's like kind of why we're watching these specific games we did watch uh one of the games from the grand final though already Uh, but yeah, I think we have some decent conclusions so far. I think what's very interesting to me, and since you watched a lot more PCS, uh, Z5 on 5, you might have a better take on it, but it was like, it felt like early season, no one in this region gave a shit about Drake. Which, and by this region, I mean like specifically the, the PCS region. Uh, no one seemed to give a shit about Drake. They were take like frequently not even taking Drakes until like 11 minutes. And then PSG seemed to like even more not give a fuck about Drake. And they would always play for Drake setups for like retakes and not have positional advantage. And that's their their priority on Drake's change for playoffs is what it felt like. Uh, engage. Oh, Maple just gets hit. Okay, so this is like the second time where...
Mabel's just like walking up on a and having to burn flash early on like a champ and then fighting in melee range. All right. Nice. Yeah, but they also lost a lot of grubs. Like, PSG lost a lot of grubs. It was weird because it felt like they put so much emphasis on having winning bot and then, like, never took drakes. And then would go, like, 50-50 on grubs because it felt like they cared more about enemy not getting grub advantage than getting grubs themselves. So they would take, like, a couple grubs and then not care that much. But it was, like, they would end up behind drakes. They would end up doing retakes. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, it was nice from um, Nautilus. Bestow, let's go. This is the goat. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they don't need six grubs, but it felt like P P PSG always knew you don't need six grubs. And then PSG, even though the region prio on Drakes was shit, their prio was even more shit, if that makes sense. I think what improved for them the most was one, Drake priority, and two, mid jungle coordinated way more. Because there would just be timings where it was like, very obvious that jungle should hover mid, and they should TP2 there. But then, I don't know, Gen Zhao would be like fucking off somewhere, farming a random camp, and Maple's base would get delayed or some shit. Alright, here we go. Okay, Evie in, in the front line, control. Noise. Yeah, I mean, I noticed that because they were like fourth. But that's why we tried to get a good sample to kind of like see what changed about them going from regular season to playoffs. Because it's also important to see like habits. Um, I still am not super convinced on their bot lane. Like, still not super convinced on their bot lane. Uh, but, you know, they had, they had some good, good, definitely some good form and good moments on flanks. Like, I think the best thing about this team is, like, when they're doing retakes, uh, when Maple has flank angle, like, he, he, he always gets, like, really, really good angles. Doesn't hesitate. But then, unfortunately, when he's playing, like, these mages, he just plays them like they're TF or some shit and griefs. <laughs> Luckily, there aren't that many of them that will be meta. So he's fine. Uh, that's pretty much it. I did want to look at... Well, there was there we watched um in the grand final we watched Evie Evie like completely whiff the TF versus Rexai matchup in an isolated one v one. I do like Aja. I think he has some like creative plays that will catch out enemy tops if they're not paying attention. Like he free fakes his bases a lot. See if it was meant to be. Um, alright. So I wanted to look at some draft trends if I had extra time. Which I have about 10 minutes. So we can try to look at some draft prio. Alright. So frequently this is not pick order though. There we go. So. Uh, it looks like first pick Ari or Karma. Rumble first pick for CFO makes sense. Then 
on red. They really like the buy Talia. So this is like, again, or the Talia combos, which again indicates to me that they kind of like the Talia knots. Like they really do function around uh, Maple's agency. It feels very similar uh, to Nip. Some in in like I, I actually feel like it's fair to say this team is very similar to Nip. Um, like they will prioritize bot lane dominant traps, but they won't necessarily get a lot out of. the bot lane dominant champs, if that makes sense. And then, like, they will... Their top laner has some, like, good creative moments. He doesn't necessarily have cheese picks or anything, but, like, some good creative moments. And then they really play around, like, Maple's timings. I would say their Drake setups are, like, similar to FlyQuest. The only one that figured out Talia is OP. Yeah, that's what it looks like, no? It's legit, like, only... Because you look and it's like, okay, it's it's picked red here. Okay, picked... Okay, okay, okay. Soft... The, the Hawks figured it out. They got it. But it was, like, late in the season. So let's see. Talia is another PSG pick. Uh, okay, Hawks played it. Another PSG pick. Red, PSG, okay. Blue, PSG, okay. So by, by, by and large, Talia is, is being picked by PSG, but there are some like Hawks instances of picking it, but it seems late in the game. Noise. The Caitlyn was interesting. I think their siege comps were good. I think by far Junjao's best champs that we saw were like uh, Xinjiao and Maokai. Other stuff was like meh, but that's mostly what he picked anyway. Yeah, I think, like, the one game that we saw versus... Was it CFO or BYG? Like, the Poppy just completely wrecked their draft because of Callista Pryo. Was it this one? It may have been this one. No, it wasn't this one. Because they picked... Poppy into it. It was Poppy and then, then Ash. It was it would have been an earlier season. I forget who it was. It may, oh, it was the it was the BYG game, yeah. Poppy wrecked their like entire draft. Or or no, it was CFO then. Because I think it was this one. Because they had Calista? No, there was no ASOL. What the fuck? What Poppy game was it? Oh, was it this one? It may have been this one. Yeah, because it was it was no, it was Callista. It was Callista Nico. It was Callista Nico. I'm trying to remember which game it was, but Poppy completely wrecked their draft in the game we watched. It was uh, very enjoyable. I liked it, um, and they couldn't do anything. Uh, anyway, ads are going, so this is like a good time to send you guys off. Um, the for the ads, but I think the the big thing for me is like we'll finish doing this actually because I think this is fine. Artelia is huge. I think they don't get a lot out of controlling bots. Um, their Drake setups improved a lot, but I still think, like, if, if Mabel's not playing a flank champ, then they seem really lost. It's easy for Junja. I think part of the problem is Junja just goes in, and if he doesn't have anyone to follow him up, he still goes in, and he just dies. <laughs> so I think you need 
Jinja, Jinja's gonna play like a dive trap or Maokai, and he needs someone to follow him up. Or he needs like someone to instigate, like if he's pressing R on Maokai, and someone to like engage and control the fight for him. That's what it feels like. It also feels like if you are constantly like late on Drake setups because you're maximizing getting as much farm on side as possible, then you need a flank jump for f to to retake. So since they play like that, it makes a lot of sense that Maple would play a lot of flank jumps. Yeah, Galio works. Uh, anyway, we will go ahead and we will take a look at who can we raid. There's gotta be some good picks. For raiding. Pay it forward. Who do I get if I do this? Could just raid Kalthus again. It's been a bit. Uh. Oh, detention is playing in Brazil. That's fun. I'm down to raid detention. It's been a bit since I've caught a detention stream. All right. I will talk to you guys tomorrow if you're interested in... We'll try to tackle Gam tomorrow. I'm not quite sure how I want to tackle Gam, to be completely honest, because I feel like I don't know what to do for that, to do like my, my normal approach because of the, the changes to the rosters and everything that happened in VCS. So we'll just like have some fun with it and see how it goes. Um, but I will see you guys tomorrow. <laughs>